the Hagman and Hagman Report for today. It's Wednesday, July 3rd, 2014, the day before our Independence Day here in the United States of America. Domestically, uh, for those listening within our borders, you know, uh, we're going to be live tomorrow, uh, regular show tomorrow night. But I just want to say, uh, for those of you who won't be joining us in advance, uh, happy Independence Day, if that applies still. Anyway, I'm Doug Hagman, co-host along with my son, Joe Hagman. Together, we are the Hagman and Hagman Report. Folks, you're about to hear three hours of unbiased and uncensored news, information, and analysis. We've got a tremendous show for you tonight. Two very special people, Mr. Steve Quayle from stevequayle.com and Mr. Tom Horn, uh, author of a new book. By the way, Tom Horn's website is Raiders News Update. That's RaidersNewsUpdate.com. Uh, it's linked right off of HomelandSecurityUS.com. But um, uh, he's got a new book out called Blood on the Altar. Now, uh, while we're uh, while we're going here, I just want to say the uh, uh, I just want to thank everyone first of all for joining us tonight, and thank you for your belief and your trust in us as we walk through this virtual minefield together. Of course, we broadcast live each and every weeknight from 8 to 11 p.m. Eastern Time. Our home base is HomelandSecurityUS.com. We're also simulcast by the Christians United Broadcasting Network. There you can tune us in at the Hagman and the Hagman Report dot com. Want to send a very special hello out to my good friend Karen in Rome. Uh, God bless you, uh, uh, Karen, for doing what you do and everything you do and making the really uh, uh, just taking the extra effort for uh, for the broadcast. God bless you. Thanks and thank you each and all for joining us. Joe, welcome to tonight's broadcast. It's going to be a great show. Yes, it is. We have both of our guests with us, both Mr. Tom Horn and Mr. Steve Quayle. It is going to be a fantastic show. Uh, Blood on the Altar is the name of the uh, book coming out by Tom Horn. Steve from stevequayle.com. I'm going to hand it over to you, sir. It's great to have you back on, and let's get this show rolling. Well, greetings, everyone, and greetings to the saints worldwide. You're loved by the living God, and tonight, I believe, is the most pivotal and the most crucial, uh, probably, radio broadcast at, as it affects our future. We watch horrific images of Christians being beheaded, uh, slaughtered, their throats slit, uh, absolutely mowed down, shot in the back of the head, everything that's going on, and still there's this suspension of belief that that would ever come here. Tom has written a book that is absolutely, I think, the most timeless key to unlocking what is the future for the Christians. And in, in his uh, Blood on the Altar, the Coming War Between Christian versus Christian, I was blessed to be able to write the foreword to that book. And uh, I can tell you point blank that Tom's right over target on this. And I want to just open it up uh, with, if I can, and I think it will be a blessing from the Scripture because I think it's critical that people understand that this isn't just Tom and Steve ranting on what's coming. This is the prophetic word of God for the last days out of Matthew chapter 10. And I think that it's critical. And I'm going to have Tom, after I read this, I will basically turn it immediately over to you. And then when you're ready to turn it back or at your convenience, you can turn it back. But tonight, this is about blood on the altar. It is the most critical issue. It will affect every single believer. It will affect every single believer's family. It will affect every church, those who follow Jesus and those who have already sold out to the powers of hell. So that's what we're talking about uh, tonight, and it's critical that we, you know, touch a subject in the fullest context of understanding that the reason the Lord Jesus has told us this in Matthew 10 is to prepare our hearts for it. But listen to this, and this is where I'm just going to start at uh, verse, and I'd say uh, verse 17, Matthew 10, 17. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues, and they shall, and ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my namesake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought of what ye shall speak, for it will sh be given to you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. And the brother shall deliver up the brother unto death, and the father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And, she, and you will be hated by all men for my namesake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Now, again, blood on the altar, the coming war between Christian versus Christian, I believe is the most critical 
wake-up call that we can give. Tom, welcome, and thank you. Go for it. Hey, uh, Steve, great to be on the air with you and Doug and Joe. Uh, once again, the Hagman and Hagman show is probably the best show out there on the air and the most germane right now, so I would encourage people to make it a regular habit. Uh, and this time around, of course, to you know discuss what's undoubtedly one of the, to use the term germane, one of the most germane, one of the most important, pertinent conversations that unfortunately a lot of church leaders right now are neglecting. Thankfully, lay people seem to be more involved in this conversation right now than many of the leaders of institutionalized Christianity, and that is the development worldwide at this very hour of a war on Christianity. Uh, And uh, now, some people recognize that in Muslim countries, our brothers and sisters are being slaughtered. Steve, you did some shows recently where you were talking about that and actually providing some of the examples of what's happening in these ISIS countries right now. Uh, But what's being overlooked is the development in Western countries, including uh, Britain, which is falling under a new dark age now, here in the United States where persecution of traditional Christianity is rising. And there is a there's something happening in the subsurface that so many of our kind of easy um, commentary, news media type commentary uh, is completely missing. And let me give you a quick example of what I mean by that. Just this week, the big picture was significantly missed in the Hobby Lobby case uh, that was before the Supreme Court and a, a narrow majority of the Supremes said that Obama or Obamacare could not force companies to uh, provide abortifacients if it conflicts with their Christian or pro-life points of views, the business owners' points of views. And so now you have so much of the church out there that's celebrating that as a true Christian victory, but I haven't heard a single person point out in these churches how that the majority of Americans this same week, by a whopping two to one, disagree with the Supreme Court decision and believe, we're talking about 66% of Americans believe that Christian-owned companies ought to in fact be forced by the federal government to provide abortifacients to their employees, act against their conscience, and do what the federal government tells them to, whether or not it aligns with their religious belief system, two to one. Well, that illustrates uh, something beyond this one decision, that there is a deeper melee, there is a deeper social condition that is developing right now that true believers need to prepare themselves for, a growing tide, not just in ISIS countries and Syria and and, and Iraq and places like that, which is horrific. The, the things that are happening to our Christian brothers and sisters over there are terrible. But what is sneaking in uh, under all of that conversation is a growing negative public opinion about truly born-again believers. People don't care if you're religious. The world don't care if you're religious, for crying out loud. But but be truly born again. Be a watchman on the wall like Steve Quayle and, and Hagman and Hagman have been for a very long time. And we've entered into a period in history where people like this are going to be abandoned. Uh, Steve was quoting uh, Matthew chapter 10. They're going to be abandoned by their own family members. Son's going to turn against the father, daughter against the mother. Ultimately, this is leading to a time of such tribulation that true believers, according to the Bible, now if you don't believe the Bible, of course, then you could just shut the radio off and go have a Pepsi. But according to the Bible, ultimately, true believers are going to be beheaded for their witness and for the word of God. And, uh, and during the tribulation, as we call it, dispensationalists call it the great tribulation period, for not worshiping the beast or his image. Notice that word, worshiping the beast. This is going to be a system of religion, a global religious system in which you are going to worship this man in the place of God. You're going to do what he tells you to do. Otherwise, you're going to face severe persecution. And now for the first time in American history, the majority of Americans believe that the federal government really ought to have this intrusive power to push their bureaucracy into every corner of our lives and tell business owners, and, and by the way, this is, going, this is going to go further than that, this religious persecution. Um, first, Steve did a good thing, so let me not get jumbled up in my language here. He started with the scripture, and that is 
where uh, we should uh, start. Um, Matthew, Jesus says to his disciples in Matthew 24, then they will deliver you up to be afflicted and they will kill you and you'll be hated of all people uh, for my name's sake. Earlier he tells his disciples in John, the time comes when whosoever kills you will think that he's doing God's service. Isn't that an amazing verse? I mean, think about what that verse is saying, that the day is coming when people will believe that they are in the ministry, that they are in the ministry of God, that they are serving God by killing born-again believers. Uh, Elsewhere in the Bible, Revelation, Daniel 7, it talks about how this Antichrist system, which is partly political but partly religious, this new church of the Antichrist is going to have power to make war with the saints and to overcome them. So if you believe what the Bible says, then you have to understand that a war is coming on true Christianity. And in my opinion, the reason I felt compelled to contact all of these people, Steve Quayle to write the introduction, uh, Gary Stearman, Chuck Missler, all these different people to write chapters for uh, this book. And, of course, I wrote the opening part of the book to deal with the fact that it seemed to me that we are suddenly, all of a sudden, we are entering into a period of time that smacks of ancient biblical prophecy having to do with a period in time in which Christian is going to be aligned against um, Christian in a battle that ultimately is going to result in the death of those who are born again. This, this, this end times church is described as literally swimming in the blood of the saints, as literally drunk with the blood of the martyrs. And if you look at the world right now, including now inside places like the United States, which historically has been a bastion of uh, Christian freedoms, you can see signs developing in three ways that I hope we have a chance to talk about tonight, Steve, uh, Doug, and Joe. One is on the social front, what some people call the culture war, which, of course, beneath the surface of that phraseology are supernatural dynamics, but the social front. Secondly, on the technological front. And then thirdly, on the supernatural front. And the last time we did radio together, we, we touched a little bit on the technological and supernatural uh, and so I'd like to start with the social, and then we can go wherever you want to go, Steve. But there is something that needs to be said right now, and it takes guts to say it. It takes guts to broadcast it, because you know that ultimately the day's coming pretty soon when we're not going to be allowed to say these things uh, anymore. But right now the most visible social line in the sand that is playing out in churches uh, and pitting born-again believers against Christians who I think are in name only, is this contention over what the Bible says about homosexuality, gay marriage, and the so-called gay Christian perspective that is playing out in what I believe to be apostate churches. Now, this is not, for the listener, just so you know, that's not what this book is about. It's just, there's a couple of the authors in this book, Blood on the Altar, that briefly mention the homosexual agenda. Uh, But really, that's not what it's about. Not even one half of one percent of this book deals with this subject. So it's not what the book is about. But I want to say something about it uh, tonight, because I believe as watchmen, as preachers of truth, that we have an obligation to repeat what the Bible literally says about issues and not to change it or to modify it in order to try to make it fit our own personal wants and desires and lusts. Uh, and I should also note that the uh, the gay marriage and the LGBT rights movement, as it involved the church, is merely, I think, the first salvo toward forcing Christians to do things that they would not want to do. And it's going to force this line in the sand. For instance, what I mean is pretty soon pastors are going to be forced to perf- perform gay weddings or they're going to lose their credentials in the same way, or they're going to lose their nonprofit status. The government's going to say, well, you can go ahead and have a church and go out in the backwoods and say whatever you want to say, but you're not going to be allowed to advertise on television. You're not going to have a nonprofit status anymore. You're not going to enjoy these privileges. And te- I'm telling you, this is coming, and probably sooner than any of us realize. Christian television is going to face the same thing. 
uh, uh, radio broadcasting, the Hagman and Hagman show, shows like this. We are uh, 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 publishers like me, Defender Publishing. We are going to face exactly the same thing, and very soon the agenda is already set in motion. It's already in order. It's already happening. It's already being agendized by the federal government, the U.S. president, the vice president, and departments of this government to make this a federal uh, and an international agenda where when you broadcast your opinion, you're either going to have to balance that opinion with a contrasting opinion, uh, or you're going to have to remain completely silent on the issue and refuse to say anything whatsoever about it, or you're going to lose your nonprofit status, you're going to be kicked off the air. And then what's going to be hot on the heels of that kind of persecution is going to be things like preaching that Jesus is the only way to get to heaven. That's going to be designated as hate speech. Uh, and then preaching anything about hell, telling people that they're going to go to hell for any reason whatsoever, hate speech. And I'm telling you, this is already happening. It's driving a wedge between true believers in Christianity uh, and uh, Christians in name only. Uh, and it's going to be a big topic. Now, um, I'm a little bit rambly here. I apologize. I'm kind of hot on this issue right now. Um, I want to make uh, one thing really clear to the to the listeners. It is my opinion that homosexuality is no worse than many of the other sins that are in the Bible. And as a matter of fact, I'm certain it's not nearly as loathsome to God as the pride and hypocrisy of many judgmental Pharisees that are sitting in church pews every Sunday morning and or also having authority over local church bodies. Uh, uh, Steve started this show quoting from Matthew. Just go read Matthew, the 23rd chapter, and see where Jesus saves his fiercest denunciations, his greatest woes, his strongest condemnations for the leaders of the temple that used manipulation and megalomania to control the common worshipers. Uh, uh, so I would want the listener uh, to keep that in mind. But having said that, Steve, Doug, and Joe, isn't it amazing now, isn't it amazing how the Bible so many so long ago, 2,000 years ago, said that one of the very last signs of the end of man would be a return to the days of Lot, Luke 17. Uh, and, and the days of Lot, this wasn't just a time where there were some gays, uh, or where even partially that was normalized, the thing that marked the days of Lot was this was a time where government accepted it, promoted it, agendized it, and Lot, who was evidently a believer, but somehow he was part of the local civilian government because the Bible says he sat in the gate of the city, which was an elder position, he apparently tolerated it somehow, even if it was against his own conscientious beliefs. So when the Bible predicted this very time we have entered into, it wasn't simply saying there's going to be gays on the earth in the end times. There have always been homosexuals. But, but that this lifestyle in particular would somehow stand out as endorsed and even promoted by both government and religious institutions, something that has only recently become reality in the most powerful nation on earth, and that is the United States. So isn't it amazing how it seems overnight this, this, this phenomenon in the United States of America – uh, just get a couple changes of presidents and a couple changes of people on the Supreme Court, and all of a sudden we're being told that it is our international responsibility to promote the LBGT with American taxpayer money. Interesting. A, a very, very good observation, Mr. Horn. And, uh, uh, well, as we expected, and Steve's been talking about this, and, of course, um, you're right on the Hobby Lobby decision. So, Steve? Well, I think that what, what is really critical for people to understand is that this is not something that is going to be collision avoidance. This is something that's going to be and is being thrust upon the true believers. And I think the other thing that, that Tom has written about that's critical is the fact that we're now seeing the assumption of even Pentecostals, certain Pentecostals, obviously James Robeson, Kenneth Copeland, and others being brought under, if you will, the robes of Rome. If someone would have told me years ago, I always expected the you know, Presbyterians or the Episcopalians or Lutherans to, to basically just go walking headlong into the tribulation period, hand in hand with the false prophet. The point being is it was not 
how should I say this, on my radar that the circumvention of the true, when I say this, of, of the Pentecostals and the true power of God, I'm not saying all Pentecostals manifest the true power of God, I'm just saying that there has been historically the power of God manifested in the gifts of the Spirit and the teaching of the gifts of the Spirit. But what's astonishing is James Robeson is, is using John's, Jesus' prayer in John, that we all might be one. And here's the difference. You cannot come into agreement. What fellowship has has uh, the, the the cup? You cannot take the cup of the Lord and the cup of the devils at the same time. The communion cup. And what we're seeing is all roads leading to Rome, or that's the philosophy. In other words, there's, it doesn't matter how you get to God because nobody goes to hell. Everybody goes to heaven. And basically, call it what you want, but we're all one big uh, uh, singing song of kumbaya and the. Uh, coming times where only mankind will succumb, or excuse me, overcome all the problems facing us. You see, basically, at the root of all this, and, and Tom said that the Lord Himself saved the greatest scathing judgment for pride. At this very core, basically, what the devil's promising all his followers through the mainstream religions is, "Ye shall be as gods yourself." And he's holding out to them a technological whirlwind of wonders. They'll be able to live forever, which Tom and I have talked about on transhumanism, that they'll be able to basically download their subconscious, that all their weaknesses and all their diseases will be healed, that they'll never have to worry about pain. That'll be dealt with, too. So in essence, the devil is promising his followers heaven on earth. Forget about the God in heaven. He, you can have it all here right now. And obviously, with Jesus speaking so clearly and so concisely about hell, and, and for the record, is anybody that just basically passes hell off, or as they say in North Carolina, hail, as they pass that off, you can know that they've never, ever really had an understanding of what Jesus did when the Bible says, for this purpose was the Son of God manifested, to destroy the works of the evil one. In Matthew 10, Jesus said he didn't come to bring peace on the earth, yet to bring a sword. So the point is, is that as the whole earth is corrupt uh, before God, the earth was filled with violence. And isn't it amazing that when you look at the context of biblical love, versus, uh, and I will call it, I've, I've told people this, Tom, I don't know if you've heard me say this, I've written about it and you've read in my books, but the origin of homosexuality originated with the fallen ones, uh, mm -hmm. the, teaching their offspring that it's the same thing with abortion. Abortion was not known to mankind until the fallen angels taught the women of earth how to do that. So the history of, of all of these habits from antiquity and the origin, and Doug, what I think is important tonight is we're going to deal with, and Joe, we're going to deal with the root of evil. And it all goes back to pride, because again, the kings of the earth have set themselves against the Lord's anointed. That's Jesus saying, we will not have this man rule over us. And the fierceness, the ferocity, and the uh, velocity at which this is coming at the true believer is something that I believe God is, is taking this time out, this three hours tonight, 180 minutes, and break it down into seconds, but 180 minutes, this is, if you will, this is a time out. This is a time period for people to ponder this and to go to the scriptures and see what the scriptures say. And I believe, Tom, that as the pastors have failed to even preach the real gospel, let alone even come close to it, that they've prepared their people as sitting slash dead ducks. And it's tough to soar like an eagle with the faith of the uh, patriarchs when basically you're sitting in a duck pond being fed duck pellets and all you're doing is being fattened up for the slaughter. Go ahead. <laughs> well, uh, I also want to say that I would not want anybody to think that I'm motivated by hatred uh, of any particular kind of person. I, I, I don't hate homosexuals. I don't hate any. I don't hate drunkards. I don't hate anybody. Um, what I'm simply saying is that this this line now is being drawn in the sand. It's being forced upon us. It's being forced. It's putting us in a position where both the federal government and the liberal church is saying, you will either uh, agree with the agenda, uh, or you're going to be shut down. You're not. We don't want to hear any literal preaching of the word of God. So we don't want to hear that Jesus is the only way. We don't want to hear about hell. We don't want to hear about you're going to accept the global warming agenda. Uh, you know, that's what I'm saying. 
that there is a that that the liberal church, which is growing, is doing what you said you would have never believed that the Pentecostals, right, would start marching in lockstep uh, to Rome, and they're literally announcing that the Reformation was a mistake. The Reformation is over. Uh, and we can all come together, sing kumbaya, pray to Mary, we're all going to go to heaven, I like you, you love me, everybody's cool, the gays are with us, they get to go to heaven too, everybody gets to go to heaven. Uh, but I'll tell you that in the same way you were surprised by Kenneth Copeland and some of these national figureheads now misquoting scripture in order to uh, say that the prophecy of Jesus is being fulfilled and that we're all becoming one, i.e. the Reformation was a mistake, and so now we're repudiating that and we're going back under the big umbrella of the guy dressed in white. Uh, it, what surprised me was uh, is what's happening with some of the stalwart Protestants. Um, you know, with all respect, I mean, I worked for many, many years in the Assemblies of God, so I'm qualified to say that there are charismatics and then there are charismaniacs, if you know what I mean. I mean, there's there are solid, biblical, theological, Bible-believing people who are also Pentecostal. And then there's just some really crazy people that have to fall under that banner. And unfortunately, some of the most well-known national names happen to be some of those uh, whose preaching has been very light on biblical uh, theology and more on experience and things like that. And so those people basically have set themselves up to follow anything that happens to put, you know, if they get tingles on their skin or something like that, a, a fleshy experience uh, or a particular kind of sign. Jesus said that that uh, an adulterous and evil generation seeketh after a sign, and many of the charismatics that I've known throughout time pretty much don't seek Jesus. They just seek signs. So that kind of thing kind of sets them up for a superficial uh, fall. But now add to this organizations that we would have never seen this coming. For instance, Multnomah Publishers, really? I know many of the employees at Multnomah Publishers. In fact, they've done work for my publishing company, Defender. I've hired uh, some of their editors, some of their typesetters in the past. I've known those guys. I live next door to their big uh, publishing house. I know some of the some of the VIPs in that organization. And now, under their label, Convergent Books, to publish God and the Gay Christian by, I think his name's Matthew Vines, whatever his name is, arguing that gay relationships are as acceptable to God as that form of marriage that the Almighty outlined in the Bible between uh, a man and a woman. I can tell you that the founders of Multnomah Publishing House have got to be rolling over in their graves today. Who would have seen that coming? I just I would have never seen that coming. Last week, of course, something that was a little more predictable, the Presbyterian Church voting to accept gay marriage as Christian uh, and boycotting Israel. Uh, Vice President Joe Biden on the heels of that, gathering together with these different religious advocates and rallying uh, this past Tuesday behind the U.S. presidential LGBT global ultimatum that's now saying that all nations and citizens are either going to support the gay rights international agenda and, it, and read the language of what Biden and other factions of the U.S. government, including the U.S. president, are saying. They're saying that, it's going, that this agenda is going to, quote, trump national cultures and social traditions, end quote. That means conservative religious beliefs. And if it doesn't trump it, it says you are going to pay the price for being inhumane. That's a literal quote, pay the price for being inhumane. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you better underline that sentence because whenever your government tells you that you are going to support a particular agenda or pay the price, uh, they're not just playing with words here. They're telling you that something is being mandated. You are going to support it, and whether you like it or not, your tax dollars are going to go to support it, and you better shut up and mark in uh, cadence uh, to this new agenda, or you're going to pay the price. And if you doubt that, look at the, the, the Oregon case where you've got a, a lady who owned a, a cake-making company, a local company. Uh, she's a Christian, and she did not want to make a cake with two men standing on the top of it for a gay wedding, and they sued her, and the courts ruled uh, against her and said she has to pay a fine. She could even go to jail, or she can shut her business down. So they're deadly serious about um, what they're talking about right now. And this is, of course, coming from the top down, from the executive level down, from the president, Obama. 
He's the one directing that U.S. diplomacy, foreign assistance, is going to promote this agenda around the world. And Biden is simply his parrot. And by it, as you know, isn't a very good parrot. He usually gets his words all messed up. But uh, he's the one that that publicly acknowledged that across U.S. government agencies right now, officials are being instructed to make the promotion of gay rights abroad um, a priority. So. It's an astonishing time that we've suddenly come into, but it wasn't astonishing to God or prophecy. And that's my point, is that this was foreseen. What we're talking about in blood on the altar, the coming war between Christian versus Christian, this was foreseen. It was predicted that the time would come when such a line would be drawn in the sand, and you either will accommodate uh, the mandate to walk in, walk in lockstep with their agenda, or you're going to find yourself on the outside, and it's only and this is only just like I say, this is just one of the first firebrands, the first salvo. It's going to get worse and worse and worse until finally you will not be allowed to be a true watchman, a true preacher of the gospel, or you will be taking your life literally uh, in your own hands. And by the way, there's a lot of other instances right now, not just that one uh, business owner. In Oregon, there's a, another one that um, I think had a photography company. But, but so let me move past this this question though and say something else. All of this is not just a sign of the end times. It is also a sign, ladies and gentlemen, of the decay and the fall of America. Um, if you study history like I have studied history for many decades now. Um, this was a sign of every great nation that ever came to ruin. Look at ancient Rome. Um, and, and, oh, and one other thing we'll talk about in a little while, it's also a sign of powerful demonism and growing occultism in the United States. But how many know out there that reverence toward and spiritualizing of homosexuality was a clear uh, sign at the end of nearly every great ancient culture, every culture that ever came to ruin. Most people know that's true of Rome, where you know you had all these famous affairs that were being celebrated from the crown throughout the, the Senate and in the military. How many know, though, that even gay marriage was one of the final markers of Rome? Um, you can read, you can go online and do this, by the way. Read the famous work that's known as The Twelve Caesars, by Roman historian um, Suetonius, and read what his what he talks about in his chapter on Caesar Nero. Now remember, Caesar Nero, that's the Roman emperor that the Apostle Paul appealed to during his imprisonment. But Suetonius talks about how Nero loved this young boy named Sporus, and he had him uh, castrated, and then he married him, and they had a big wedding in all this regalia. So during the decline of nations, this is something that happens. It's not new. Uh, in fact, what followed in Rome as they were falling apart and assigning their battles now to be hired out to foreign armies and all the rest of that that everybody probably is familiar with, uh, go and read how they then began to turn their priests uh, into androgynous priests. Uh, that to, they were today what we would call cross-dressers, transvestites who literally would castrate themselves to the celebration of the public and dress in female clothing uh, and act in effeminate ways in their devotion to the great Roman mother. So in Rome, eventually, you, you had the full-on LBGT movement that was being propagated from the uh, federal level on down. Then study ancient, the, uh, as, well, for that matter, as far back as the Canaanite religions. I remember years ago when I was studying this issue, being astonished that even in Canaan, the priests became effeminate. And the, uh, the, these were the priests of like Anat and Sibyl, which was uh, worshipped in more than just Canaanite religion, Rhea. Uh, but their priests became effeminate. Then uh, look at the uh, at the later years of Hinduism and this belief that develops that anybody that unifies the sexes in sexual practice has reached the highest level of self-identity. That also happened in the medieval West where the alchemists were transformed into heterosexual uh, androgynines. Um, in ancient Egypt, the Inca religions, homosexual, bisexual priests became common. 
Uh, in American Indian religious practice, homosexual transvestites to this day are its shamans. Um, in Latin America, the Caribbean islands, homosexuals became the magicians with supernatural powers. And if you went to the gay temple uh, to visit the gay prostitutes, that was actually conducted as a means of spiritual sanctification. That's what's actually being said in its own way by the new uh, book by Multnomah Publishers, for crying out loud. Um, even in the Jewish Kabbalah, and some Jews might not be aware of this, but the ideal, go and read about the ideal of the cosmic androgenine. This is an entity that's committed to global spiritual oneness. The very thing, Steve, you were talking about a moment ago, that as we begin to celebrate uh, a lack of sexual distinction, uh, spiritual oneness seems to begin emerging at the same time. Of course, we know the reason that's happen, happening is because at the root of it is a supernatural evil that detests everything that God and marriage and sanctimony uh, actually represent. So what you see happening around the world today being championed without comparison by the modern church and the United States government under the current administration should not be overly surprising if you understand history and also if you understand prophecy and geopolitical realities pointing to the end times uh, because, as the Bible said, as it was in the days of Lot. Man, what a marker, huh? How amazing it is that the Scripture would say a moment's going to come. The days of Lot are going to be revisited. And But when it does, lift up your head and look up. Your redemption is imminent. Um, one other thing I'll say about this, and I'll quit talking about the gay thing. Um, it, it's not just a sign of prophecy. It's not just a sign of the decay and fall of America, and that with historical precedents. Uh, but it's also a social condition in which the church is being divided. And again, that's what takes it back to this thesis, blood on the altar. On one side are the born-again members of the true body of Christ who do not hate homosexuals, but they're not going to alter or pervert the word of God in order to accommodate anybody's particular sin. On the other side is the shell of Christianity made up of religious believers who are being primed right now for absorption into a great harlot, one-world religion that Steve basically referred to a moment ago. And this is described in the book of Revelation as an entity that is going to make war against the saints, with whom it says the kings of the earth are going to commit fornication. So isn't this amazing? It's spiritual. It is religious. It's, it's worshipped. And it mingles with fornication. Um, and those who dissent her mandates are going to be persecuted. And right now, it's exactly what's happening. I mean, I can hear the voices. I, I assume that the majority of people li who listen to Hagman and Hagman are already very conservative. But I know that you reach a very broad international audience, uh, Doug and Joe. And I imagine there's some of them out there right now that are their eyes are rolling. They think Tom Horn's a bigot. They think I'm an enemy <laughs> of progress. Uh, but I'm not surprised by that because I'm telling you soon we're going to find ourselves in a predicament outlined in this book, Blood on the Altar, martyrdom or compromise. Or as we said on Raiders News Update a, key, a couple of weeks ago, Steve, did you notice the, the, one, the one article uh, in which we talk about how we're going to be separated for extreme persecution in the coming war on true Christianity and we're going to be ostracized by the same spirits that wanted to rape angels in the days of Lot – who this new pope that you mentioned a moment ago is already on record uh, as being sympathetic to their cause. He's already declared, who am I to judge over this issue? So he's a great champion now for this rising uh, apostate uh, church. And did you notice that last week Rome announced that it's bringing its theologians together to reconsider their language around the LBGT issue so that they can create language that will be more accommodating to the lifestyle. Well, I'm telling you, it's going to be the new mantra. And if you dare say that God's already judged that issue or other issues, you're going to be taken off the air. You're going to be silenced divisionally. Eventually, you're going to be imprisoned. You're going to be killed. You're going to be a social undesirable. And we are seeing the development toward that re uh, reality unfolding right now. And the gay marriage issue is only just the first salvo, the first firebrand, but uh, it's going to get a whole lot 
worse, a lot more issues. And that, and these coming issues, by the way, are going to make the gay issue pale by comparison to what's going to happen in the technological and super, uh, supernatural fronts that are coming. There are those who believe, and I would love to think that they are right. There are those who believe, however, that that this thing can be turned around, that through significant, meaningful prayer and repentance, uh, at least what is happening on a national level in this country can be turned around. I'd, 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 I'd like to think that that is true. I'm fearful that it's not going to happen. Uh, g- gentlemen and, and uh, Tom and Steve, but w- w- uh, before you leave this issue, I just uh, happened upon a Williams Institute study from April of 2011. The total percentage of adults identified as either homosexual, bisexual, or even on the transgender the list is only 3.5% of the population here in the West or in the United States. Right. So that, that would suggest that 90, 96.5% uh, well, well, of adults in the United States are heterosexual. They identify with that lifestyle. So, so how is that possible that a slim minority of 3.5% seem to have such power, influence, and uh, uh, legalistic uh, influence over what's going on, and especially in the church? How is this possible, and how is it possible that no one is seeing this coming? Well, that's not true, Doug, that no one's seeing it's coming. Because, and, and, and please, I'm not, I'm not saying this to challenge you, but I think the point is, is that simply this, the, the people who claim to believe in the Bible, who were, quote, nominal Christians, never learned about the phenomenal part of salvation, that being the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and Jesus saying, because I go to my Father, greater things will ye do than I've done. Well, we can't even begin to stack up to any of the things yet. I mean, there are people that are seeing true biblical miracles of the first century church, but I don't think we can leave androgynous right now. Androgynous is an interesting word, because it basically means to have the physical characteristics of both sexes. And if you look at fashion, there's the blurring of the line has become more and more apparent. And, and just the fashion of the day is nothing more than, I would say this, a photographic uh, picturing, of an, a, a photographic outpicturing of an internal change. Now, Hermes, it's interesting, hermaphrodite means, and, and people need to know, this is why, Tom and I both refer back to Greek mythology or Roman mythology, but Hermes was was the god, second son of Zeus, who was in charge, you're going to love this, transition and boundaries. Aphrodite, obviously, everybody knows about Aphrodite. She's the goddess of love and beauty. In my book, Xenogenesis, one of the most remarkable things, Tom, that I turned up in research was the technical, uh, if you will, attempt to make an androgynous creature, and I'm sorry, but we're all adults here, it's in my book, Xenogenesis, with multiple sexual orifices that basically don't need, in other words, they have both male and female parts, different ways to use those parts, and literally to produce the sensations associated with uh, with a normal sexual relationship between man and woman, and, and so they don't need anything or anyone to go and have sex with themselves. Now, you know, that's a pretty astonishing statement when you find out who's making that statement. It's one of the head, if you will, uh, voices in the world for singularity. Now, were you aware of that, Tom? I, yeah, absolutely. In fact, that's exactly yeah. what I was thinking of as you were speaking. Right. So so this is critical, everyone. Now, what is boundaries? You go to the book of Genesis. Man, I love Genesis. I love the word Genesis. I've used it, I think, in three different book titles or references to it in three different book titles. But the point is it goes to the very fight that God set everything. He set boundaries, and he saw that it was good. The idea of tearing down all of the God-given boundaries is absolutely imperative. And I said, Tom, the other night on Joe and Doug's show, when I think Pastor Langford, the devil gets mankind to sin against God, to be so egregious in their flaunting of sin that God's holiness demands that he judge, and he will. Because obviously the scriptures, and, and this isn't, uh, by the way, this is so much bigger than than the gay issue, but what's in, in indicative about the gay issue, or why it's probably uh, one of the most unique barometers, is because this was 
And you and I have talked about the return of the Nephilim. We've talked about, I have, and you have talked about the giants. The preference of the giants was for the same sex. Uh, Diodorus even chronicled in his writings the fact that though, though there were giantesses in the British Isles, the giants, the males, preferred the pleasure of each other. I mean, making the distinction, a fallen angel can change shape. Paul said they can transform themselves into uh, angels or uh, ministers of light, but the, the giants which were born of a fallen angel, earthly mother, those are the entities I'm talking about. So what's new is, is that just as the days of Noah and the days of Lot were in those days, this whole breaking down of boundaries is upon us. And I think that's what people have got to understand. So when we're talking about this, look at fashion. Everything is basically becoming more and more, and, and it's a good word, androgynous. By the way, in the movie that I think was one of the best movies ever made that was prophetic, the movie, the actual movie Stargate, not the TV series Stargate, do you remember who the Egyptian alien was? He was an androgyne, wasn't he? Right. And so, so uh, and the the thing is, is that androgyny has now come into fashion. Androgyny has now come into quote metrosexual. See, people don't understand, and uh, and I'm not talking now. I'm talking about the whole trying to be girly men, you know. And and somebody once said, Steve, God meant for <laughs> meant for men to drink beer out of tankards. He didn't uh, mean <laughs> for men to drink uh, milk out of bowls, you know. And uh, I thought that was pretty good. He was responding to a word I used called meow men. But if you even go beyond that, the, the, the reversals and the roles in marriage have changed so dramatically that as we see the return of the days of Noah, as the days of Lot, we're also going to see Jezebel arise. And what's tragic, in my opinion, is a woman's movement that so wanted equality and everything from you name it, to uh, uh, you know, from pay to position to authority, yet they're silent, aren't they? As as the women of the world, especially in the world of Islam, are slaughtered and butchered, and absolutely every form of horrible thing are done to them in India and all different parts of the world, and that's coming here too. The bloodlust, and this is something that's interesting because Tom, you quoted the scripture that listen, the whole earth becomes drunk with the blood. It, I, I have a I, I have a little bit of understanding on that. If Abel's righteous blood called out to God from the ground, the harmonics of that, meaning the literal frequency of life, whether it was, and you and I actually talked about this, you remember, I think maybe two or three shows ago, the point being is, is that, that, that that noise of all the slaughter, of all the blood, that is going to, basically, to the wicked, it's going to empower them. To God, it's going to... Uh, basically justify that which he's getting ready to do on the earth when in one day he judges it and so mightily and so swiftly but the point is is that the blood will cry out and yet we don't listen to the cry of the blood of the 60 70 million aborted babies we don't we never did the church was silent and i said years ago when i started on talk radio and i'll stand by this statement inasmuch as we fail to defend the helpless the innocent and they who could not defend themselves, there will be no one to defend us who failed to defend them, outside of the Lord, outside of our faith, and outside of uh, whoever gets sick and tired of just the sense of slaughter of blood. But this is why, ladies and gentlemen, this mythology is so important. This is why when you see the false idols of Anubis being carried throughout the land, this is why when the Mayan elders carry the crystal skulls, and are when they claim to be blessing the land, you don't understand. They're cursing. They're cursing you. And so this, this can't we all be supernatural honey bunnies, you know, doesn't work. And I'm sorry, but listen, this is real stuff. When, when you've got the temple of uh, uh, Diana, I believe it is, and I could be off on this in Nashville, and you've got the situations of even the uh, proposed statue of the Baphomet in Oklahoma, whether it's, it, it is fulfilled or not, it's the spirit behind it. So the bloodlust, and as, as Hawk likes to say, the Lucy sacrifice of blood is building up to a crescendo. And I get emails all the time, Tom, well, I think you guys just don't see it for what it really is. No, we see it for what it really is. And I tell people it's not the fact that, that we're trying to engender fear. 
We're trying to give the antidote for fear, which is the truth of God's word, the power of God's spirit, and the redemption of the blood of Jesus. So this androgynous thing, Doug, is very critical. But remember this, 3.5%, who gives their power unto the beast? Every Mm -hmm. Fortune 500 company now is pushing the gay agenda, every single one of them. Now, I don't think people understand that, but Chase, one of the biggest banks, also the biggest basket cases, has come out and basically demanded a statement of faith from their employees. Did you guys see that? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Okay. So so the, quote, line is in the sand. And, uh, again, when when we put into perspective that except Jesus shortened the day, there would be no flesh left alive, in, in Genesis, it talks that all flesh had corrupted itself. This, there are certain things, and Tom, I say, I say this, and I know you say it too, but God judges nations in history. He'll yep. use one wicked nation to punish another wicked nation, and when that punishment is uh, fulfilled or filled to the brim, then God takes, he intervenes. We're seeing that right now in the Middle East. And let, let's just look at the Middle East real quick, because this is very germane to the blood on the altar. I don't know... Who, Doug, outside of us, meaning us, those of us who have been guesting on your show for a number of years, have called the Middle East for what it is, the entire destabilization of sovereign nations, whether you like Saddam Hussein or not, this stuff wasn't going on under his reign, whether you like Qaddafi or not, this stuff wasn't going on under his reign. So look who comes in to position of authority, and the whole Middle East starts to fall under an Islamic prophecy of the return of the Mahdi. You know, and then look who is embracing as 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 you see one brand of Islam just slaughtering Christians up and down or the different sects. Then you've got the Pope and Imams coming to uh, uh, an agreement to try and be uh, one big happy family. And again, it's critical that people understand that this cannot be done in God's view, but it will be done in the world's view. So just as much as the androgynous, if you will, and the hermaphroditic, Hermes, and and by the way, Hermes, also Mercury, the thing that's interesting that was noted about Hermes was the speed at which he accomplished feats. Isn't that fascinating, Tom? Yeah, absolutely. And that's what we're seeing. Yeah, I mean, the speed at which things are accomplished. You mentioned the Pope and him inviting um, people to come for a prayer uh, for Middle East peace. Uh, there at the Vatican, he also, of course, has been on record already that he supports uh, the Hamas presence in Gaza and is against um, w- what they consider to be the persecution of those Palestinians in those territories. They don't believe that that property belongs to uh, Israel. Therefore, they don't believe the, the biblical covenant that God made with David and Abraham. But in any case, um, but but where where was he also being encouraged, if not but from the United States itself? I mean, our president, our vice president, our ambassadors putting enormous pressure on Israel to surrender covenant lands uh, for the purposes of a peace treaty. Now, all of that, however, is only really just a precursor to what is coming. There is a man who is coming, and he is going to, for a period of time, achieve peace. Uh, in the Middle East. He's going to have a covenant. It's going to be broken in the middle of the week, according to Daniel. We're talking about the Antichrist. So once again, prophecy is on fire in the world right now. It is on fire in the Middle East. And no wonder that uh, the Muslims believe that Mahdi is about to arrive, because they too can see everywhere they look that the Middle East is a boiling pot. But where did it, but, but, so where did the Pope get his energy from, if not from those who came before him, which was the leaders of the United States of America pushing for the very same thing. And let me say something, because while we're talking about the gay issue and these other issues, and and I'll I'll come back and say something about the androgynous um, mythos that you brought up in a moment, but as a leftover of early American influences, now I'm talking about the Pilgrim movement and up through the great generation, people still tend to think in America, a lot of Christians think, that America is, quote, a Christian nation. But statistics show that devotion to real Christianity hasn't existed for a very long time. It's mostly just been replaced by a title, meaning that sons and daughters that have been born over the last 60 years, they may wear that title. They identify as 
Christian, but only because that's what their parents were. But they themselves, for the most part, don't practice the faith in any meaningful way whatsoever. I've said numerous times when we've done shows together that if my grandfather, who lived to be almost 100, if he was alive today, he would not even recognize. And I, I mean this. I'm not being sarcastic. He wouldn't even recognize what we call Christianity. Christianity, to him, was something entirely different. It wasn't something that you said. It's something that you was. You could read his testimony and his actions, if you know what I mean. Meanwhile, though, today, real devotees uh, of uh, religious supernaturalism have been growing in this country. Uh, and they're not Christian. They've dramatically changed the religious landscape of America over the last 40, 50, 60 years. I'm also not talking here about New Agers and Wiccan witches and that sort of thing, even though that also is true. But recent statistics show that, there's a, that there has been a rapid, demographically shifting portrait of religious belief in what was once that um, homogeneously Christian country of one nation under God. For instance, the second largest religious tradition among Arizona residents is, guess what, Hinduism. Uh, across the western United States, Buddhism now ranks barely behind those who would mark Christianity on their hospital records. And guess what's become the second most reported religious tradition in 20 states across the South and Midwest United States and is actually the fastest growing in those states' religions? Guess what? It's Islam. Not Christianity. Islam. And now, of course, uh, uh, and I know that Joe and, and uh, Doug, you've been talking about this on your show. Our recent invitation to illegal immigrants to cross the border by train loads also shows, when polling them, uh, a frighteningly high number that identify as Muslims, and not just Muslims, but Muslims of the radical kind. And they are very thankful right now for this open border policy because they're, they go to bed at night having nasty dreams about Sharia law and this caliphate that's sweeping across uh, uh, the ISIS countries right now coming here to the United States of America, and they know exactly what their role is going to be regarding real Christians in this coming war on born-again believers. So uh, I would love to say that America is a Christian country, but statistics right now illustrate that most of the Christians are Christian in name only, but the people who uh, uh, identify with other religious persuasions, especially the radical Islamic segment that is growing like a house of fire in this country and is already only second to Christianity in half of the states of this union, these are true believers, true believers. And when their Mahdi arrives, brother, they're going to know what side of this battle they're on, and it's not going to be on the conservative Christian side. That's very true, and we can thank our Muslim um, uh, director of central intelligence. We can thank our Islamic uh, renegade in chief and every apologist that surrounds uh, Barack Hussein Obama, as well as the night stalker Valerie Jarrett and the uh, the communist the, those people who are uh, uh, part of the communist agenda. Uh, that uh, of course they're using uh, Islam as a tool to uh, to nullify or to really uh, destroy this country, folks. We're up against the top of the hour, gentlemen. We're up against the top of the hour. Uh, that hour went quickly. Got to tell you, uh, we're going to be right back after these messages. You're listening to the Hagman and Hagman Report. Very special guest, Mr. Steve Quayle. SteveQuayle.com. Tom Horn. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to hour number two of the Hagman and Hagman Report on this Thursday, July 3rd, 2014, on the eve of our independence anniversary, July 4th. We are with Tom Horn and Steve Quayle. SteveQuayle.com is his website. Tom Horn, his latest book, Blood on the Altar. And it is a fast-paced, informative first hour. We want to say a special hello to Gene, listening, listening from Beijing, China. Thanks for reaching out to us and let us know you're listening uh, all the way out there from China. God bless you, sir. With that, we're going to jump right back into things. I'm going to hand it over to Steve Quayle for the second hour, and we'll pick up right where we left off. Well, I, I think that one of the places we have to take into account is remnant, the word remnant. The word remnant means that's that which remains or is left behind. 
the part of something that is left when the other parts are gone. Now, here's what's an interesting application. A small piece of cloth that's left after the rest of the cloth has been uh, sold or used up. The remnant is a very amazing principle to understand, ladies and gentlemen, because God will always have a people. When Elijah thought he was the only one that hadn't bowed his knee to Baal or Baal, the point is God spoke to him and said he has another 7,000. Sometimes you think you're fighting this alone, and that's what my prayer is, Tom, for all the people that you and I uh, influence or speak into their lives, that God will bring them into true fellowship of like-mindedness. Now, I, I think that the important point on this, as we into this, go into the second hour, is the remnant. There is going to be such a winnowing process. Unfortunately, we know where it's going to start. It's going to start in the household of faith. That means, obviously, we quoted, uh, I did Matthew 10, in our own homes. We're going to have kids turning on us. And, and I talked to a woman at the uh, uh, Whitestone Conference who really, in confidence, told me she didn't know where her kids would stand. The difference between Tom's grandfather or his father, I'm sorry, it was probably your grandfather, and those of us who basically came into this through the Jesus movement versus those who had a godly heritage and lineage is people who walked with the Lord had a transformative experience. That means they were one thing, they became something else. And I think the remnant is something that is going to be very, very small. I'm not putting a number on it. That's God's business. I can't even guess. But one of the things that is interesting, Tom, in the realm of barriers, and this is what we're talking about in all realms of barriers being broken, is a rainbow. Because in Genesis 9, 8 through 17, God made the rainbow as a, as a visible representation of the spoken covenant he made with mankind, especially Noah's family, that he would not destroy the earth by water again. Doesn't mean there would be floods, just the great flood that wiped out every uh, human being and all the flesh that was on the earth. Now, naturally, fallen angels do not have flesh unless they take it upon themselves. So if they hung out on other planets or in subterranean uh, hyperbaric chambers, wherever they were, they, they made it through, obviously, because there were giants in the days both before Noah's flood and after Noah's flood. Where do you think David fought Goliath and Goliath's brothers and King Og came for? That was all post-flood. But the point that's critical here is, is that the rainbow has been adopted as the visible sign by the lesbian, gay, uh, bisexual, transgendered uh, community. And I thought that was interesting. It, and I want to share something. In, in chapter 13 of my book, Xenogenesis, this was what was basically given to my friend Will, who by a deathbed confession of one of the CIA's top, top men. Before he died, uh, Will thinks he may have come to know the Lord. But the point that is important, or the point that's important for everyone to understand is this, that when you see something that was once related to the things of God being taken over, you've got to look for the root of why that's happening. And I could ask 99% of the Christians, of course the ones that listen to us would know the answer, but who, who would never even consider that. Why is the rainbow being so uh, promulgated and so placed before all to see. And I'll tell you why. It's an open mockery by the powers of hell to mock the very God of heaven. You see, discerning of spirits isn't just in a list in 1 Corinthians. It's a practical application of that which we need as human beings to have the discernment that God gives so you can see the spirit behind something. Again, I'm not, I don't hate anybody who's gay. I don't hate anybody who's a lesbian. I hate the devil. And the Bible, my Bible tells me we're to hate evil and resist it, even to the shedding of blood. The point is, is that when people make it about a, a, what I would call a visible issue and completely deny the invisible, just like the whole thing with the ecumenicism that we're seeing in Rome, we're seeing what, what is beyond my imagination. But Jesus said if the days weren't shortened, even the very elect would be deceived. The biggest ministers in the world who 
have the biggest public projections or persona are falling for this thing, hook, line, and sinker. So the point is, is that remember, when Jesus was crucified, and it was the religious community that went to the secular, and that would be Rome, demanding his death. Rome was not the, uh, Rome was the executioner, but they were not the prosecuting attorney. It's the religious. And so that will be with us, ladies and gentlemen. You want to see war? I should, I should just share my email. One of these days, Tom, I'm, I'm threatening to just make my emails public because if you say attack any of the grail-like beliefs of, of people who don't want to deal with the time, uh, you know, 88 reasons why Jesus is coming in, in 1988. Now we're up to 2014, 15, and there are things where, how do I say this? The rapture-ready people can be as ready as they want, but it ain't going to happen until the word of God is fulfilled, and things grow evil and more evil. And I sense now, I sense such an animus arising. When you ask someone to look at the root of what they believe, most people can't tell you why they believe it, and they'll say, well, my pastor told me and taught me that. What happens if your pastor is an apostate? Because I can tell you this, there are exceptions. There are wonderful men of God in the pulpits, but they don't have the mega churches. They have the 40 and 50 and 100, 200 members. So the remnant is very small. The rainbow is very real. And, and I would say this, if those of you have not read Chapter 13 in my book, Xenogenesis, I'm pitching the information in that chapter and chapter one, which Doug Hagman wrote, and W uh, gave him some information. The bottom line is is that these are two of the most important revelations in my 43 years of being saved by the blood of Jesus that I've ever read in my entire life. And the third one was, Tom, when you and I were doing a show together years ago when we first started, when you basically quoted, and I finally got it, that the gates of hell would not prevail. It was like that was blocked to my understanding, and I think tonight will be one of those watershed nights where people are finally going to get it, those who have ears to hear and those who have eyes to see. By the way, Tom, people are asking if you can speak up a little louder because I'm getting emails saying that you're really hard to hear. Oh, okay. Well, I'll speak up louder. Hopefully this helps. Look, Steve, I mean, the idea of the remnant you're talking about, even uh, if the remnant is small, uh, it would not bother me, and it would not bother you or the Hagmans if the remnant is small. In fact, sometimes that's the way God prefers it, right? <laughs> he tells David, go out and reduce the size of your army, because one of you will put 10,000 to flight. So the idea of a remnant, even a small remnant, um, a handful of disciples in the New Testament, the book of Acts is a story of a handful of people turning the world upside down, causing the decline of occultic religions, some of those that you were talking about earlier, Di the worship of Diana. Uh, great is the Temple of Diana. These were religious orders that had been in place for 2,000 years that crumbled within a very short period of time following the dynamic preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that kind of history gives me hope that a small groundswell could, in fact, start something. Something could happen that becomes a mustard seed that moves the mountain. And I want to believe. I do. I want to believe. I want to believe that for many different reasons. I want to believe it against what my research, uh, your research in your new book, this research in Blood on the Altar for which you wrote the introduction, I want to believe against what the statistics in those investigative works uh, imply. I want to believe that when Franklin Graham stands up uh, among a number, a number of Christians and is calling now for a proclamation, but we need more than a proclamation, um, but they're saying that it's America's last hope. We need another great awakening. We need a great awakening that would be born out of desperation, but more than that, it's got to be meaningful prayer, but it's got to be more than that. It's got to be repentance. It's got to be true repentance, right? Um, I was on the radio earlier today with Southwest Radio Church, and they open every show saying God is on the throne. Remember, the, I can still say it the way David Weber did many years ago. God is on the throne, and prayer changes things. You know, But that was more than acute colloquialism or a statement. God is on the throne. 
and real prayer does change things. And, uh, you know, John Knox was so well known for intercessory prayer that the Queen of Scotland, Bloody Mary, this woman wasn't afraid of anybody and didn't respect God or anything else. She burned the Protestant reformers at the stake during the Marian exile. But she confessed in her own writings that she feared the prayers of John Knox more than an army of soldiers. Well, it's that kind of spiritual activity, if it can really happen. The problem is, I don't see it happening, but I'm not saying it's not going to happen. I, I would love to believe that it will. I would love to believe that, for you know, as, as Americans and as Christians around the world right now are experiencing such horrendous persecution, and as persecution grows, history has shown that persecution doesn't stamp out the fire of the church. It makes it stronger. Um, and, uh, you know, I've never prayed, Lord... Uh, let our nation go on to go into great persecution so the church would wake up. I don't pray that way, but I know that historically that has happened. There have been times in history when, as you opened this show, talking about how God has raised up nations that judge other nations. Well, that's the book of Judges in the Bible, right? Every time it says, and Israel forgot the Lord their God. What happened? A nation, you know, a, a rival nation comes in, an army comes in and overthrows them, or or uh, nature itself uh, causes the collapse of their society. And then what does it do? Then it says, and Israel remembered the Lord their God, and they repent, and they get a good judge, right? And then they become powerful, and God blesses them once again. Could that happen in the future of this country? Sure it could. It certainly could. But it's not what I'm seeing today. And it's not what all of the testament of what appear to be other prophecies around the world are attesting to. And <clears throat> in this second hour, I want to make sure that we bring up another one of those points about prophecy, uh, Steve. You touched on it before we went to the first break. You were talking about androgynous beings within myth. Um, I spoke with one of the world's leading transhumanists. I interviewed him for our upcoming film, Inhuman. And that's one of the very things that they talked about, how they have this strong desire for androgynous realities among many of the transhumanists. Uh, and if one thinks that that desire uh, is shared only by, you know, fringe transhumanist personalities, go to the Brookings Institute, the number one think tank in the world that bends the ear of the U.S. government and C Congress and our U.S. military and read right now their new series that they're writing called The Future of the Constitution, in which they're talking about the very stuff we talked about in the first hour. They're talking about genetically engineered gay communities in the very near future, and that we are going to need to extend, we're going to need to modify the language around the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, because on the very near horizon are going to be genetically engineered humans. Some of them are going to be genetically engineered to have a, to be predisposed to a gay lifestyle. That's the uh, kind of the sample that they use over there to introduce their legalese around why we're going to have to modify the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. But then they go on to talk about other kinds of genetically uh, engineered humans, including transgenic humans, transgenics. Most people don't even know what the term means, right? We're talking now about humans who would have alien DNA, either synthetically created DNA that somehow enhances their human DNA, or the introduction of animal and plant DNA that makes them something other than human. And what the Brookings Institute is saying is that this is coming. It's coming sooner than most people are prepared for. And therefore, we have to introduce the language now. We have to start drafting Law. We have to start writing legalese in order to prepare the courts, the justice system, and, and then ultimately the public at large for the idea that there are going to be human non-humans walking among us, but they still deserve to have the right uh, to be protected by our Constitution and our bylaws. I mean, think of that. The very idea of engineering our genes raises this specter of what the Brookings Institute are talking about. We, we might call them man-made monsters, but they're going to be different than human. And I can see a time uh, where our courts are going to have to decide, what does it mean to be human? 
Does a person have to have two biological parents? Uh, would a crossbred ape man have civil rights? Uh, will we cloud the distinction between animals and humans? Will we cloud the distinction between male and female? That was part of the conversation of the first hour. And just so people know, uh, the, the catch phrase has gone from sex reassignment surgery to gender reassignment surgery. And that language is intentional because in the legal system, the goal right now is to change state and federal definitions of male and female from birth to exist from what you were at birth to physical existing physical characteristics that, rather than your gender at the time of birth. Now, to make matters worse, if you read the arguments that are being making that are being made at the Brookings Institute, the number one policy think tank in the world, to make matters worse, cloning. And alternative conception and gestation methods are being developed right now that satisfy the legal requirements of genetic reproduction by sex-altered couples so that two men can have a true genetic offspring. They won't need a surrogate any longer. Uh, but, but this is going to get more complicated because now an animal human might decide that it too wants to have some other kind of an offspring and as a result of its animal-human genetic engineering, its reproductive system doesn't work because it wasn't made by God, and therefore will use cloning and alternative genetic uh, production. Set. By the way, this isn't coming out of the demented mind of Tom Horn. This is coming out of the of the uh, 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 out of the Brookings Institute, out of the largest think tanks uh, in the world, out of. Budgets that are being written by the Defense Advanced Research Projects uh, Agency. We ran an article just this week, yesterday or day before, at Raiders News Update, uh, talking about genetically modified blood that will be used to defend soldiers on the battlefield. It's already been developed. Now, I'm all for defending our soldiers from biological hazards on the battlefield, but we don't know what genetically altering their blood and then introducing into that system will do. That could unleash plagues of biblical proportions. It could do all kinds of stuff. We don't know what it's going to do, but we're going to do it anyway. And over the next 20 years, including gender confusion, is going to, well, it's going to exponentially escalate through the additional mutations of transgenics and whatever, um, where in our genetic structures are going to be altered through introducing these various types of foreign DNA into our genome. Well, I would only give people one guess who's behind this. They tried to do it once before. It happened in the days of Noah. And people need to be concerned with the ramifications, not only because it might be prophetic and not only because the plagues released through transgenic research and genetic modification of humans could be of biblical proportions, but frankly, and this goes back to my very um, simple-minded and conservative Christian upbringing, this kind of technology is an affront to God. It is an affront to the divine order. And that, my friends, is the crux. That's the dividing line between Bible-believing Christians and liberal or Christian-in-name-only Christians, the belief that these are God's words, that this is God's design, that there is a divine order, that God requires humans, animals, plants to reproduce, quote, after their own kind. Biblically speaking, it's, we're, we're, we're talking all the way down to species integrity, uh, including the ideal of male and female. This originated with God, not with me. And whether we're talking about uh, uh, the homosexual agenda, which if it was followed through with its, with its full implications would literally be calling for the eradication of all life on earth because species of the same sex cannot give life to something else unless, of course, we create it in the laboratory and then it is not life after its own kind. It violates the order of God. It speaks to the issue of confusion of the species. Uh, in fact, well, I don't want to get off on that. I want to talk about why um, genetically engineered humans, transgenically altered 
humans how this kind of science is leading to something that I believe is also very prophetic and is very connected to this war between Christian versus Christians, Christians with, you know, uh, uh, italicized uh, implications that are going to serve under this army of the Antichrist. I think it's important, Tom, too, for people to understand these aren't wackos. These are the most well-funded, brilliant in their own... When I say brilliant, obviously the fool has said in his heart there is no God. But the way that the genius level of the fallen uh, potential of fallen man, I think it's important that people understand that uh, when we see the Nazi state in America, the fourth right, final right, call it whatever you want, but we are seeing the same fascist state arising in our time as we did see up to the years leading up to World War II. And by the way, I think Doug, uh, uh, was it Doug Krieger and Doug Woodward did a great, great story that everybody must read on Raiders. It's uh, part 14. And my compliments to both those men because the, the fact that Hitler, people think Hitler was an atheist. He was a master orator that turned the people's beliefs to his agenda, and in that agenda he was able to basically get, quote, religious people to go along with the slaughter of other people for the sake of their country. Now, Hitler obviously was influenced by Nietzsche, and the point that I want to bring up is Ubermensch, the Superman. Tom Horn and I started talking about this stuff, what, Tom, a decade ago? At least, yeah, at I least, would say, yeah. yeah, at least, maybe longer than that. So Ettinger, R.C.W. Ettinger, Man into Superman, talking about what his idea of a superwoman is. Now, here's something that people have got to understand. The idea of, of these guys is so, by your standards, by my standards, and by the God of heaven who created man when he basically formed Adam out of the dust of the earth or out of the clay of the earth, I want to quote this. It's because, you know, it's funny to me. People watch all kinds of crap on TV and all of the different programs and all the different uh, commercials, and it's sex, 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 sex. But when you understand what these people are wanting to do, they want to basically end mankind. See, that's the end of it all. Whether it's the Veterans Administration, and I just I got to bring this up. I, I received a, an email today from a 62-year-old woman, I think, or right close to 62, and a doctor was pleading with her at the vet's hospital to get all surgery done before next year because, and I'm telling you, this is straight from the horse's mouth. After 62, veterans are going to be denied almost all care, any quality of life care, any elective surgery, any necessary surgery. That's eugenics, ladies and gentlemen. But in order to understand Ubermensch, that means a superman, the point is, is that you've got to understand that some of these people are absolutely only taking the former Nazi statements, putting a new technological spin on it. And I want to read this. The sexual superwoman may be riddled with cleverly designed orifices of various kinds, something like a Wrigley Swiss cheese but is shapelier and more fragrant, and her supermate may sprout assorted protuberances so that they intertwine and roll over each other in a million permutations of the sex act, tireless as hydraulic pumps. Now, that's, that, that's a pretty staggering statement. But when you understand, listen to this, a little too vulgar, all right, those who choose spiritual expression of supersex may never touch each other at all, except with tender tendrils of the mind. Each could represent the distilled essence of feminine or masculine personalities and quiver with exquisite joy and exchange of precisely the right word or glance. And every such thrilling encounter retire for decades to analyze and relish it in prose, poetry, song, drama, and finger paints before running for the next. The interesting thing to me about the whole phase of techno, what I would call it, techno-feudalism that we're entering into is they will, they'll naturally preserve the, the real act for themselves, but they will give a drug or a cybernetic uh, thrill to their adherents, their drones. In other words, when they become part of the Borg, they'll have a way of stimulating the Borg. One of the most interesting uh, 
science fiction movies, and I'm not suggesting people watch this stuff. I watch it to see how basically the sci-fi uh, is a picture into the future of what these guys have planned for us in the movie Species. Exactly what Ettinger is talking about before that movie was ever made is what it shows the aliens in their embrace. So the point that I'm trying to make in this, and, and Tom, here's a new word for you tonight, okay? We're gonna, I'm going to give you a new word, synthesomes, okay? Synthetic chromosomes inserted into the DNA of human beings, in other words, synthetic biology, to produce the uh, artificial construct, what you refer to, to as ARTELEC, artificial intelligence, but also a synthetic reality, and that's what virtual reality does. You see, when you and I are talking about heaven and hell, we're talking about Jesus, we're talking about redemption, we're standing up for, for the, the faith once delivered to the fathers, the, hate, the, the faith of the living God expressed to those who turned the world upside down. You've got to see something that's amazing. Where the early church and the church till about yeah, 1970, maybe 1980, 80 is when it started going wacky in my opinion, they've become silenced. Because they didn't understand the words of Jesus. I, I, I wish everyone would get a red-letter Bible and just read the words of Jesus. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. That means to the degree that these pastors, preachers, uh, religious writers, scholars want to uh, embrace the world. See, they, they're more concerned with being accepted by the world that knew not God than they are at being accepted on those last days. And somebody once said, it is the most slick way of damning people to eternity and absolutely getting them caught up in the now with no thought of tomorrow. Go ahead. <clears throat> well, Steve, that description from Ettinger uh, of future intimacy, is that in your new book? Yes. You know, it's it's interesting because I can tell you it sounds almost identical to one of the world's leading transhumanist philosophers that I also interviewed for our upcoming film. But don't forget that uh, sex, uh, and great sex, by the way, was central to the promise that the Watchers made to the world just before they introduced the Nephilim that became the army that wanted to wipe out the righteous people who were on the earth. And so we're seeing a repeat now. And that's why, partly why, though I wasn't familiar with Ettinger's um, philosophical comments, uh, but that spirit, right, that spirit goes back into antiquity. It promises people that they're going to have the greatest levels of pleasure, something that is beyond human, but out of it comes control, comes Hitler, comes the armies of the Nazis, comes the Nephilim of the ancient days, comes that something that this murderous spirit really uh, wants to make a covenant with humanity so that it can introduce in its time that Antichrist, the Apostle Paul in his day said there are many Antichrists that have entered into the world, but the book of Revelation tells us that there is a final one that is coming, and he's going to put all of the other ones, all of the other Hitlers, all of the other uh, wannabes, Antiochus Epiphanes, Mojo, Tojo, Mussolini, all the rest of them, he's going to put them to shame uh, in the, at the level of his wickedness and at the level of his brutality. Uh, but under him is going to be an army. He's not going to do it by himself. There's going to be an army, and that army is going to partly be made up the, of the religious, spineless religious community that is going to be so afraid of something that they're absolutely not going to be willing to stand up for the, those who are born again being both imprisoned, beheaded, and as you said about the acoustics earlier in the book of Revelation, it says that their voice is crying out from under the altar of God in heaven, those who were beheaded for their testimony. Um, do you remember, Steve, Joe, and Doug, do you remember last time we were on the air and I threw out this idea that genetic, of epigenetics, but genetic alteration of humans could lead to this zombie-like army of merciless killers, that this could... This could play a role. It might be part of the new Nephilim, might be something in addition to the return of the Nephilim, but a but a, it could play a role in the upcoming war on Christianity. And we talked about how that, and now we're talking about secular scientists believe, that within humans there is a blueprint, uh, kind of a special 
and sometimes negative genetic combination that exists within individuals. And the fear is that it can be programmed or reprogrammed to act in defiance of normal human conscientiousness, having a soul. And so we talked about how that seems similar to the days of Noah, where you had this, this, spe this spe I can't even talk, this specific genetic aberration um, that was created and that killed without remorse or without a soul, without consciousness, the Nephilim. And that Jesus said in Matthew 24, 37, that the end times was going to witness a return of that activity that happened when Nephilim first walked upon the earth. And the question then, have we entered that period of time, a reprise of the days of Noah? Certainly he also combined it with the days of Lot, which we can, which we can see occurring around us right now. But if it's the days of Noah, we're talking about a genetic hazard. We're talking about the repeat of something that gave birth to a monstrosity. It unleashed literally a global army, a pandemic. And the question is, if that's true today, are we talking about uh, something that could give rise to something similar? And there are different scenarios. We talked about the Will Smith film, I Am Legend, the idea that there could be a Nephilim virus, if you will, an event, something that globally modifies epigenetics worldwide and therefore somehow numbs the mind, the makeup of even churchgoers, uh, all who would be not protected by God. And in the book of Revelation, remember that he puts his seal on their forehead. He seals them so that these plagues cannot touch them. But if you're not sealed by the seal of God, something happens. People are touched by various things, and they can't even die, so they are very zombie-like. Um, and so we talked about this, those different scenarios. This last week, there was a special edition of Through the Wormhole with Morgan Freeman. Did, did, did any of you watch that? No, I didn't see it. I did not see it. Well, maybe you can go back and and somehow get it on your DVR or something. I'm not technologically sound here, by the way. <laughs> I, can, I can barely use a phone. But um, go back and watch Through the Wormhole this last week that had to do with a zombie apocalypse, Morgan Freeman hosting it. And, and, but the show asked this question, is there any real science? Is there any real scenario that could actually give birth suddenly to a plague of zombie-like persons that don't die and that kill without conscience? And they discussed, actually, how it would be possible. Uh, and especially if rabies mutated into a flu-like virus that then would become airborne and spread like a wildfire. Fire. Um, they talk about the symptoms, uh, how, it be, how it could be mistaken for a common cold until suddenly the person changes, and now it's too late, and they become violent. They start biting people in order to spread the virus like a person who actually has rabies would do. But I was surprised how several of these experts, global experts, not Johnny Come Lately's men of science said that we are just one hair breadth away right now from that actually happening. Um, when, uh, when we were working on this book, Blood on the Altar, I actually uh, corresponded with and investigated a professor in the Department of Cell Biology and Molecular Genetics at the University of Maryland, a professor by the name of Jonathan Denman. And he is an expert in this field, and he too said the same thing. He, uh, of a zombie virus, he said it almost exists right now. It certainly could be engineered to fully occur, but it might just happen uh, naturally. This this very thing, basically, that Will Smith's film is based on, and he uh, he said infection is nearly a hundred percent lethal. It will turn you into the Walking Dead at least for a while, and it causes your brain to change your behavior. Uh, by reprogramming you to bite other people in order to spread the uh, infection. And rabies, according to this uh, Through the Wormhole show this week, um, only need to just be slightly mutated, barely mutated, something that they fear could happen just naturally by itself, but certainly in the laboratory could be mutated and engineered to facilitate 
essentially an end times army of soulless killers. I challenge you to go and watch that show or to or to do some research on uh, Professor Denman. Also do some research on Dr. Samantha Price. She's a registered scientist um, uh, in the U.K., and she says the same thing. A zombie virus is almost here, and she says it's the most likely to mutate into something that could be similar to a zombie virus. So why is that important to me? Because we've entered into a period of time today that may have only ever uh, happened once before in history where humankind is willing to tamper with genetics. We're willing to cross over species barriers. We're willing to do things to human genetics that literally could be that one trigger moment that suddenly causes a kind of human form of rabies to begin spreading. Now, is that going to be something that will be part of the kingdom of the Antichrist? All I'm telling you is that the, when the Bible describes the Great Tribulation period, uh, as a pastor, many years ago when I would preach about this and talk with other pastors, we wondered, how in the world could we ever come to a point where people would be so inhumane? How would the armies of Antichrist be so willing? And because we're not just talking about, uh, we're not talking about unbelievers. We're talking about church people. We're talking about the biggest global church in the world under Antichrist, so inhumane, so willing to slaughter and to bring into digital bondage every human on earth. How in the world could they do that? How could you such suspend your conscience? Well, now in science we're starting to see that something like this could happen. And when it comes to uh, this idea of zombie virus, the Bible itself, now, I don't know if it's talking about zombies, but it certainly describes zombie-like um, issues. Uh, Zechariah 14.12 says, This shall be the plague with which the Lord shall strike all the people that wage war against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they still stand on their feet. Their eyes will rot in their sockets. Their tongues will rot in their mouth. So that kind of puts a whole new spin on this old prophecy of zombies is, being uh, reanimated. Revelation 9, uh, 6 tells us in the tribulation people will seek death, but they will not be able to find it. They'll long to die, but death will elude them. So some people believe that, you know, that might be talking about something like a zombie virus. But I want to ask you guys a question. You guys know, don't you, that the Pentagon actually has a plan now to stop a zombie apocalypse? Uh, I saw yes. that. Steve, you pointed that out in one of your alerts, I believe. Well, yeah, and, and Tom, the late, great Sue Bradley, which was in our both our opinions one of the best and most gifted researchers. She went to be with the Lord, what, a couple years ago. The point being, she's got, and, and go to my website, because this is Sue Bradley's doing, The Calling Forth of the Damned, The Zombie Resurrection of the Day of the Lord. It, it, she opens it with, get a kit, make a plan, be prepared. That's for the zombie resurrection. It was put out by the CDC. Some people thought it was tongue-in-cheek. But again, it's on my website, and, and this is critical because it's, you know, I, as you were talking about this, Tom, it just came to my mind, you know you got a big website when you forget where stuff is, but it's on my <laughs> website under the under the Q topics. And what, what most people don't understand is, is that Sue was the commensurate researcher. She was Admiral Thomas Moore, head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, lead researcher. And the point is, is that, and I don't know if you remember that, but they literally categorized all of the known zombie uh, events. But here's one thing that I want people to recognize. Part of the reason for the Human Genome Project and the acquisition of ancient evil people, whether it was Jack the Ripper, whether it was Genghis Khan, whether it was Kublai Khan, whether it was Gilgamesh, and the epic of Gilgamesh is the oldest poetic narrative in the world, there are certain groups within the Illuminati Luciferian world that literally go out and gather that DNA. They literally fund, if you will, the Raiders of the Lost Ark-like uh, expeditions to acquire the DNA. And what most people don't realize is when those entities so evil died, those spirits, the demons, a demon is a disembodied spirit, they go out and either inhabit someone else or they walk in dark places. They wait for the resurrection of their dead, and whether it's a evil spirit animating a corpse, and the same 
evil spirit's appetite now being expressed through a corpse, the question is, you know, when is something alive? Well, if it's animated, is it alive? If it basically has a taste for blood? What I find fascinating about the zombie uh, issue is that we are seeing, Tom, just this fascination with blood and gore. We're now seeing a return of cannibalism in Syria, and I don't know if anybody else even spoke out against it. Oh, sure, they were speaking out against the murder. But the point is, I don't think people recognize that even in Syria, Kuru, which is a disease that pretty much was limited to the uh, Papua New Guinea region of the highlands and was a headhunter's disease, was re, if you will, incubated and brought forth again, reanimated into a bioweapon. And now you've got, you've got Syrians suffering from a uh, form of... Uh, uh, oh, good night. Uh, chronic wasting disease in the brain, Kreutzfeldt Jacob disease, and you're seeing a return of cannibalism. Well, I maintain that you're going to see, with this feasting and the ghoulishness of uh, the French Revolution, you're going to see it on steroids. So I think the zombie issue is very, very, very real. And you can't get away from it because, again, whether you're dealing with Joel's army, and I believe, as you do, it's a supernatural army. Mm -hmm. And the point being, with uh, the, the, there's so much written about it, and Sue put it all together in it. I'll just leave it at this. You can go to my website, stevequail.com, go up in the Q topics up in the nav bar, and click down in zombies, and you're going to read some amazing stuff. And by the way, the Easter Islanders, uh, basically died because they, they, many believe they suffered a zombie outbreak, and there, there's even documentation of that. And one of the fascinating things, Tom, is the curse of Easter Island that even the National Geographic channel carried was that your grandmother's flesh lies rotting between my teeth. Right. Now, that's most people will talk about the Moai, the, the statues, and remember, they didn't even know that those things were giant statues until somebody said, hey, maybe we ought to dig down, and lo and behold, they dug down. So the zombie protocol that you're mentioning in the U.S. military, the point is, is that there are specific labs developing a, if you will, transgenic form of rabies that literally fits all the, qual or, forgive me, it qualifies with all the characteristics of a zombie virus. Well, <clears throat> even Foreign Policy Magazine, and, and uh, before I bypass this, let me say to the world, I loved Sue Bradley. She was a personal friend. She was a precious soul. She was a personal friend of yours, too, Steve. I know that. Um, and she did work for both me and you. She did research, but she also did research for the government. Um, she never gave up, even when she was and, – and the world would never know this because Sue was never one to complain, but she was dying for years before she actually gave up uh, the ghost. She suffered for years before she ever gave up the ghost, but she never once complained. She didn't talk about it on her blogs. The world didn't even know that except her close personal friends did. She was a real believer, uh, and, uh, and I'm glad that you're making people aware uh, why don't you tell people again where they can go on your website to find her articles on the uh, I, I on don't the think there's anything better written. I don't think anything could be written. I can't add to it. You can't add to it. I mean, not that we wouldn't, Tom. We could try. But when someone is that gifted, you just go to stevequail.com. Then under the SQ medals, there's home, Q topics. Hit the Q topics and scroll down. That's where I deal with the uh, high jump and strange skies, Planet X. But zombies is the most critical link there. And I want to just remind everybody that Psalm, listen to this, Psalm 27, 1 through 2, is where it says, God is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Yahweh is the strength. God is the strength of my life. Someone put this in their version. I'm going to read it in the King James version. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. So what's fascinating is, is that when you're talking about someone who's trying to eat your flesh while you're still standing and they're coming after you standing, that isn't a cannibal situation. That's a zombie situation. Absolutely. Well, Foreign Policy Magazine, I was going to say, they, they wrote about this. If people want to look it up, the Defense Department um, according to them, has a response if zombies attack and the armed forces have to eradicate flesh-eating walkers. It sounds like you've talked about this already, so I won't get bogged down in it. But it's a very interesting um, uh, article because um, what, the, uh, what foreign policy did 
was this was a study that was buried on the U.S. military's secret computer network. And they obtained a copy of it, and then the Pentagon admitted to it. And the copy is uh, uh, the article. Um, in fact, if you find the Foreign Policy Magazine article on this, they have a link where you can actually download now the Pentagon's study. It's called CONOP 8888. Boy, we could talk about that, couldn't we, the significance of multiples of eight. But in any case, it's, a, it's, it's, it's very straightforward. It's a zombie survival plan. It's a how-to guide for how military planners – uh, are going to try, if the case arises, to isolate the threat of the undead and destroy them. And it's very straightforward. Now, Foreign Policy Magazine, they talk about how the, the plan fulfills a contingency planning guidance that was tasked for uh, the U.S. Strategic Command to develop a comprehensive plan. They were given the task to undertake military operations to, I mean, to uh, planning for operations to preserve non-zombie humans from the threats that could be posed by a zombie horde. And in fact, by the way, I've read the report, CONOP 8888's plan, um, but just if you don't want to read the whole thing, read the summary. It speaks for itself. Uh, it, it talks about zombies that could pose a threat to all non-zombie human life and that it is the responsibility of strategic command to prepare to preserve so they have to prepare now now why would you prepare for something that's just tongue-in-cheek and there's no possibility of it ever happening why would they be ordered to prepare now to preserve the sanctity of human life and conduct operations in support of human populations against the non-dead that's astonishing now when you're reading this article, you do kind of pick up that the CONOP 888 planners are saying that they're having a bit of fun. But you also pick up that Foreign Policy magazine, when you read their articles, they're seeing through that. And Foreign Policy is a very respected secular uh, magazine, and they say that don't make a whole lot out of them saying they're only joking here. The content of the document is no laughing matter. It's dead serious. Military planners have been assigned by the U.S. Strategic Command out of uh, Omaha, Nebraska, uh, to actually task uh, a, 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 a device, a, to devise a plan to protect citizens in the event of a zombie apocalypse. And, Steve, you brought up the fact that Either you were saying or Sue Bradley was saying that that Center for Disease Control um, public awareness campaign for emergency uh, preparedness, was that two years ago, three years ago? And, and and people can go to Google and type that in, get a kit, make a plan, be prepared uh, for the Center of Disease Control, and you'll see those dead-eyed zombies, you know, peeking over the top of a rock or pe peeking over the top of a blanket and they're kind of having fun with it. But the CONOP 888 plan, if you read that, it's comprehensive. It's not just an image, and they're not just having fun with it. Uh, they're dead serious. In fact, I've got it right in front of me. Let me just give you a quick quote. They're tasked with the responsibility to, quote, establish and maintain a vigilant defensive condition aimed at protecting humankind from zombies and, if necessary, conduct conduct operations that will, if directed, eradicate zombie threats to human safety, as well as to aid civil authorities in maintaining law and order and restoring basic services during and after a zombie attack, In quote. So that doesn't sound like if they're, if they're given this task to prepare for this, and they have to prepare for it now, it doesn't sound like it's tongue-in-cheek to me, does it to you? I don't believe it's tongue in cheek. Actually, I believe it's uh, uh, it is in the context of all of the uh, statements, all of the preparations, all of the uh, connotations, annotations, and when you talk to the different people behind the scenes, whether they come out of the intelligence world or high-ranking military, I mean, they take it with a, almost as a grain of salt. Remember, the idea of a, of a population so bent on entertainment, 
so basically trained to play with their phones or to play with their iPads or to play with their video games. I talked to somebody today that came in my store, and, and the enemy of this man is his own physical brother, and the man's intercessor. And the guy said, I don't care what happens. This is quote. I don't care what happens to the world. I don't care what goes down. He says, as long as I can play my video game, I'm happy. Huh. Well, you know, and, and I think the other thing that people have got to understand, ladies and gentlemen, very few pulpits will talk about this. The reason why Tom and I and others are vilified is because, you know, I mean, I heard somebody say, that crazy quail, he believes in that UFO stuff. I don't believe in that. I acknowledge that. I believe in the living God. But the point that's amazing to me is when people cannot get answers, and here's where I think, I think, Doug, Joe, Tom, this is where the church went wrong. They could not answer or chose not to deal with some of the most amazing revelations of the Word of God. I, I tell everybody, Tom, you know this, you trained as a, obviously a preacher, the point being is, is that the, the law of first mention, you can't get away from Genesis chapter 6. You cannot get away from it in history. You can't get away from it in oral tradition, written tradition. You can't get it away from uh, from uh, uh, sculpture. And by the way, the inverse cube law or the square cube law does not apply to the supernatural realm. It's just like electrogravitics. Electrogravitics transcend the normal understanding of gravity. And and see, the problem is is knowing that, that the people on the planet are so easily captured, and that's a good word, and held in a mental prison by either music, games, anything to occupy time. The Christian is contrasted that, that we're to redeem the time for the days are evil. And one of the things we're trying to tell everyone is these subjects that you talk about, Tom Horn, I talk about, we write about, others write about and talk about. The point is, is that it is politically incorrect. Any time you tell the truth, the lies will demand the death of the truth teller. There is a powerful statement. Anybody, well, because Jesus, Jesus said he was the truth, the way, and life, and obviously we know what happened. Yeah, uh, I know we're getting ready to go to another break, and um, yes, sir. and I and and I didn't mean to get hung up on this whole zombie thing. I want to say one more thing before we go to a break. Isn't it interesting, Steve, Doug, and Joe, that if you read the Pentagon report, if you read the uh, article that's over there on the Foreign Policy magazine, uh, the Pentagon report includes the idea of evil magic. I'm not making this up. Evil magic, also bioengineering, and also intentional DNA-altering pathogens, they include those as likely scenarios that could give rise to an Antichrist end times army of soulless enemies. And when you read that, it sounds like these guys have been listening in on our conversations. It sounds like they've been listening to Doug uh, Hagman, Joe Hagman, Steve Quayle, and Tom Horn, which, of course, we know they have been because we discovered that when we did a computer drill down, Steve, uh, some time ago. You and I did a computer drill. Oh, actually, we had another guy that was a computer expert do a computer drill down for us, and we found that every branch of the United States Intelligence Agency computers had been logged into and listening to our show live. So we know they're aware of it, but why in the world? If you read the Pentagon's own special report on this, why do they include the idea of evil magic and bioengineering as one of the possibilities that could give rise to a zombie apocalypse? Interesting, right? Very interesting. Yep. And that, by the way, is dated uh, April 30th of 2011, so that's not that far. Uh, that's not too long ago. I mean, it's four, four years ago. But not, or three years ago, but nonetheless, uh, very pertinent indeed. Folks, you're listening to a very special Thursday edition, July 3rd, 2014, of the Hagman and Hagman Report. Special guest, Mr. Steve Quayle, stevequayle.com. Bookmark his website, stevequayle.com. And Steve Quayle, one quick note on the American Survival Wholesale and the products. They uh, wanted to inform us that the increase in food prices are, are hitting them now, uh, about 20 to 25 percent increase, increase in meat and poultry products, followed by uh, what they're hearing would be another 20 to 25% in about six months. So there is a short window 
where you can purchase these items before we see a sharp increase. And I just want to let you know that this sharp increase will be followed by another one. So if you can, get prepared now while we still can, while the prices are still uh, manageable. Um, with that, we're going to come back with Tom and Steve. And last hour was fascinating. I, I did not hear about that uh, ConOps 888 plan from the, the Pentagon about the uh, preparation for uh, defense of non-human entities, defense against non-living entities. That is uh, very um, incredible, in my opinion. And I'm going to do some research and look up uh, to see what that plan says in detail. But thank you for sharing that information. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Steve, and, and we'll get into this final hour. Well, I think one of the things that, Tom, we got to address tonight is not only what's going to happen, but how people should deal with it practically. Two of the questions I get asked most from parents who believe, I mean, it seems like mostly it's parents, there are exceptions who believe and their kids are not sold out to anything except alternate lifestyles. And I'm not saying every kid is, but I'm even talking about kids that came from a Christian home. How do we deal with our kids in prepping them for the times ahead? I have two practical suggestions, and I'm, I know this is going to sound harsh, but assume that until your kids have a breakthrough with the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's what you're praying for, you're not beating them up, you're not basically telling them all the gloom and doom. Obviously, living with someone in the prep business, my kids grew up with that whole thing, and, and obviously some of them react differently to the information I present. How do you tell kids they've got a future when obviously they're smart enough for those who are smart enough to see? Are, these are really tough questions, and I'm going to throw it to you, Tom, but here's one thing. Assume you will be betrayed. Therefore, knowing that until the, the Lord gives you uh, a different witness in your spirit, keep your survival and prep plans private. I know that may sound harsh to some people, but you cannot entrust someone who thinks you're crazy. And there are some people listening that need to hear this. You cannot entrust people that think, oh, mom's a little off or dad's wacky. You can't trust them at that point because if they were listening to what's going on in the world and seeing for themselves, they would be wanting to help. So in other words, here's the thing. If your children are not motivated, and, and I know people whose kids are having dreams that are motivating the parents, so it's not just with the kids. It can also be with the parents. It applies to spouses, too. I can't tell you how many men will all live because their wives would, would take a few bucks of grocery money or money that they could have spent on themselves and buy a case of food or whatever. This is serious stuff because when Jesus said it, I think those are some of the toughest words in the New Testament, personally, because it's one thing to be betrayed by somebody who's, let's say, a casual friend or even a dear friend, but it's another thing to be uh, betrayed by a wife or to have a wife betrayed by a husband or to have your kids, and, and many kids are telling on their parents, and we're even seeing the Department of Homeland Security encouraging children to tell on their parents. We're seeing new uh, questionnaires posed to children, and the parents can't be present. You see, ladies and gentlemen, everything is designed to take children out of the protection of especially godly parents. And there are even kids who are suing their parents to get out from under their custody and care and would rather have a child protective services family provided for them, doesn't matter if it's an alternative lifestyle, than to live with their parents that might want to say you've got to live a different way. So these are real questions, and, and it, it's really tough, and I don't have all the answers. I pray continually for all the listeners out there that people will know. I pray for myself. I pray I won't be the one betraying anybody, and I pray that I'll know ahead of time who might, and, I, and I, what I believe in is you sidestep it. Not sidestep the issue, but obviously, if you know it's coming and the Lord shows you, God will show you, and you pray for your kids that that won't happen. They who have no strength in themselves or their walk with the Lord, I'm sorry to say it, but I think the Scripture has already declared the way that turns out. Would you agree with that, Tom? Well, I do agree with that, and the the, the truth is, Steve, if we're going to talk about this issue, we need a whole three hours. Uh, yes. Actually, we need more than that. We need a whole ten hours. 
We need three. You want to do a ten hour? I'm, I'm up for a ten hour marathon sometime. Uh, we, we, at some point, and really, we ought to bring in you and, and other experts that have to do. Look, you know, for several years now, um, I've been working <clears throat> on something, and people have been calling it, you know, Tom Horn's scheme or 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 whatever. Because I won't tell anybody what I'm doing. Um, don't, I'm not don't, Tom. To. Let me, yeah, don't, 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 don't. Quote Nehemiah. Neither, neither tell any man what God had put within your heart to do. I'm just yeah. giving you that and continue. Uh, but it's because I believe that this battle is coming. And on the one hand, I'm this, you know, old school Assembly of God guy. But I'm not a, you know, I, I, I think that some very great. Uh, trials are coming, and I do not assume that the Lord will remove us necessarily before those trials arrive, um, and therefore prudence, according to the Scripture, both Old Testament and New, is to be uh, prepared, and I don't think that in this show right now where we're actually not even talking about that subject in particular, preparedness, I don't think that we would do justice to trying to identify all the ways in which families ought to be prepared. But I would say that preparedness, and, and literally preparedness, um, the types of investments that you can make by going to stevequail.com to plan for an off-grid situation in which you are not going to be supported by anything or anybody and it could be worse than that. Not only are you not going to be supported, you need to be in a situation where you're ready to defend what you have. I remember years ago, you had me guest uh, host on the Q Files. <laughs> now, that's going back some years, right? That's going um, back a lot of years. Yeah, I, and I remember talking to you know an off-gridder, and I said, well, what are you going to do if somebody comes to your place and they're going to take away from you what you have, your food, your whatever, and the answer was, well, let's just say that would be a big mistake. So I knew that not only were they prepared to survive in the sense that they had food and things like that, they were also prepared to defend what they have. Now, a lot of Christians are really uneasy with that kind of, of talk. And some Christians say you should only uh, just pray and defend, and expect that the Lord will take care of you in those situations. And, and and if that's what they believe, I'm not going. I'm not going to be critical of that. I just also happen to see other parts of the scripture. Uh, Noah, for instance, was justified by faith because he prepared, not just by prayer. I mean, he you know he prepared. He made an ark. He set aside food. He did all the things he was supposed to do. And the Bible does tell us in Proverbs that a prudent person sees the storm coming and they prepare for it. But it says an imbecile, an idiot, just goes blindly forward and they fall victim uh, to the circumstances. Well, I'm telling you that we, well, don't take my word for it. Listen to what the U.S. government's telling you. Listen to what the churches are telling you. You're going to fall in line. You're going to do what they tell you to do, or they say you're going to fall you're going to be treated as inhumane, and you're going to be judged accordingly. So it's not like the time is coming. It's like the time is here. Blood on the altar is almost late, Steve. You writing the foreword for Blood on the Altar and you writing your other book that just came out not long ago talking about what's happening within the transhumanist and the genetics revolution, these books are almost too late. It's not like they're ahead of the game. They're almost too late to warn people about what is happening uh, right now. Now, I do believe that parents should build walls of prayer, um, and that's a, that's a biblical precedent. Every verse in the Bible dealing with spiritual warfare confirms that there is a divine symmetry between God's authority and overcoming evil supernaturalism. Um, uh, Jesus commissioned Paul to preach to the Gentiles, but read in Acts what he says. It was to, quote, turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan 
unto God, from the exosia, from the dynamite, from the explosive authority of Satan, to God. Um, the Bible says that it's the believer's responsibility to ask before God responds, to bind and release on earth, for heaven to do the same. So part and parcel of the Great Commission is the duty of the church to cast out demons through prayer, to tread over the power of the enemy. And apparently when we do so, we send shockwaves through the heavenlies. I mean, you can read about that in, uh, in uh, Nehemiah. You read about it in Second Corinthians uh, 12, where Paul's talking about how he knew a man above 14 years ago, whether he was in the body or out of the body. He doesn't know, but he was caught up to the third heaven. So there are these... There are these heavenly realities. There's the first heaven, the second heaven. There's this domain known in the Hebrew as cosmos, the, the height, the, the area that's controlled by Satan. And what we know about that, according to the Apostle Paul's teaching, is that these dimensions influence earthly affairs. So now are what? Are we going back to what... Billy Graham's son was talking about, we need to storm the heavens, we need to pray, we need to pray for a great awakening. Well, I can tell you that prayer is never a fruitless endeavor, and especially when it comes to your own home and this idea that, you know, your children are misbehaving, you're worried that you know, they're going to join this army. They're going to be they're going to be the fulfillment of prophecy themselves as a son turns against his father and a daughter against his mother. Is that going to happen? It is going to happen. How do I know that? Because the Bible says it's going to happen. It is going to happen. But if you want to redeem your children, start praying for them now. Also, don't only build up walls of prayer, build up walls of defense in the spiritual world by taking tangible actions, and by that I mean, even if it makes you unpopular, mom, unpopular, dad, unplug the television, turn the, the game off. If they're sitting there playing some radical video game that shows them killing other humans and they're enjoying it, turn it off. If you say, well, boy, if I do that, all of a sudden, man, I'm like the most unpopular mom on earth, well, good. If if you say, well, if I do that, it's going to make them make a decision against me, then that might just be the way it's going to have to be. That's the dividing line, and that's the whole point about this conversation tonight. Blood on the altar, the coming war between Christian versus Christian, is the whole point, that a line is being drawn in the sand. And by the way, if Franklin Graham or any of those other people that are advocating for a new great awakening, if they're right, this is the only way it's going to happen. Draw a line in the sand. Make a stand. Make a stand in prayer. Make a stand in your life. Say, no more of this. The, 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 the porn or whatever that my husband wants to watch on Friday night when we're being intimate, no more of this. I'm making a stand. We're not going to do this anymore. Choose which side you're going to be on. And... Uh, so that's going to be part of this, but um, but there's also very practical preparedness things. Honestly, I'm telling you right now, I, I'm not going to tell you what I'm doing. Uh, uh, let's just say that it's an entire commune. It's an entire defensible commune because I really believe in what I'm talking about. I believe this is coming. And uh, and I believe there's a community of us that are going to come together. Um, and to the extent that we can, we're going to be there for each other. And ultimately, if we're crucified, then that's just the way it's going to happen. But to the extent we're, we can, we're going to defend those uh, that we can. So, uh, Steve, what I would say is at some point in the future... You know that th those are a whole lot of kind of just real fast, broad brush, broad strokes. If we really want to give people practical advice, if we need like three Hagman and Hagman shows where we talk about really practical stuff, um, and maybe give people advice that's spiritual. It has to do with supernatural dynamics. It has to do with prayer. It has to do with fasting. It has to do with that kind of thing. But it also has to do with really practical things. How people, if they're living in particular communities where they ought not to be, where they can go, better places where they can live. There's a there's just a ton of stuff here, right, to talk about. Well, absolutely, and and I didn't mean for it to be a prep night. I'm just saying this: 
that when Nehemiah said, neither told I any man what God had placed within my heart to do, he, he got up at night and he surveyed things. The book of Nehemiah commands us to fight for our families, fight for our little ones. The yielding that's done in families, and, and let's face it, I mean, kids can bear a lot of uh, pressure. So can unbelieving husbands or unbelieving wives to the believing partner. But let me share this. I think the line in the sand. Well, early one morning, and I don't know how long ago, a couple months ago, I woke up and I saw a large, and, and, and I haven't posted this yet because I wait until the Lord releases me to do it just because I, I, I just want that obedience. I'm working towards obedience with my scoundrel-like past. I want to be <laughs> obedient, okay? But the point is, is that, uh, and, and the taunting, and it was interesting because it was coming from Hollywood. I saw the Hollywood sign in the background. As a matter of fact, I'm seeing it right before my eyes now. Thank you, Lord, for bringing it back. And, and the mockery and the scoffing and the ridicule and the scorn and the obscene gestures. And guess what? The ground literally opened up, and it was like a rolling quake. But as a rolling quake was turn taking place, it was like the 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 uh, sides of the cavern were rolling too, just like you'd roll up a oh like a freight door. Imagine that going on in a horizontal plate, both towards the ocean and both towards the inland. And I felt like the Lord was saying to me, "Go back to my word." And you you know when obviously. The people withstood Moses, or withstood that, the command that Moses had given. Obviously, there is always someone who has their way that's better than God's way. But literally, Tom, I don't know when it's going to happen, but literally the ground opened up and they fell straight down into hell. Straight down into hell. And so, so I don't know. So again, we can leave the preparation, but blood on the altar, as, as I see it, here's the thing. What will be done? The Inquisition is nothing compared to what the what I would say the surrendering to Lucifer joint face will bring about. The blood on the altar, those beheaded for the testimony of Jesus, where are they crying out from? Under the altar. So again, because our time is running out, share kind of, if you would, just the different chapter headings if you want, because again, this is about blood on the altar. The point that had to be made, and that's why I inserted it, not to take away from it, but people are asking me that daily, okay? So we're already there, and thank you for saying that. It's not we're getting close. We're there. And so if people can understand that tonight they'll see God and they'll do what he tells them, but look, I can't live. I want all my kids to be in heaven. I want all my friends the very few that I have. I mean, I'm talking, I know a lot of acquaintances. <laughs> I, I want them to be in I want them to be in glory. But the point is, is that the compromise has killed the church and the and I'm talking and when I use the word church, I'm using the Greek word ecclesia, which literally means called out one. The first word of the church was applied at Antioch. So I'm not talking about that Catholic church. I'm not talking about the Presbyterian or Lutheran or Pentecostal. Right. I'm talking about the people of God. So, Tom, go through the chapters. I think we've got 30 minutes or so left. And, and serious, yeah, I, I, I want to, yeah. Let me, let, let me just do this very quickly. Uh, I, let me encourage listeners right now. If they want to know the full scope, they want to know the chapter outlines, what we're not going to have time to discuss tonight, uh, go to RaidersNewsUpdate.com. There's a banner on the top of the web page. Click on the banner. You'll go to a page that has a summary of the chapters, the topics, um, the full investigative book, Blood on the Altar, in a, in a bullet list. Um, and also on that page, for Hagman listeners, uh, you'll see where for one week only, starting this coming week, Tuesday, this coming week, uh, we're going to be giving away $70 and other products. So you're going to get Wallace Henley's new book, Globe Quake, which is going to tell you how to survive in the uh, coming situation, how to keep the right mindset, how to be in tune with God. Um, Pat Buchanan, by the way, I'm giving his book away, but Pat and I have had differences of opinions uh, in the past. He's more of a dominionist than I am. But this book, Suicide of a Superpower, and this is actually the hardback book, a $30 book, $28 book. We're giving it away free. Um, the suicide of a superpower will america survive to 2025 i mean it really actually covers the social side that we started talking about tonight 
He doesn't think it's going to. And he doesn't think it's going to because America has turned its back on Christianity. So it's apropos. And then there's actually the the very first three hours, Steve, that you and I record, uh, recorded with Hagman and Hagman uh, on this coming end times war. They're giving that away. So there's a bunch of stuff over there. So listeners can go there, read the summary that Steve's talking about, um, and if you're interested in that giveaway, then you can, if you buy the book, Blood on the Altar, you can get that other stuff there for nothing. Um, you can also sign up there to be notified when the giveaway is going to start this coming Thursday because I want to tell you there is really a limited amount of those free supplies, um, and it's going to be first come, first serve. Uh, if you run out, if we run out and we don't have nothing else, then they'll just give you stuff that's equal in value. But if you want those products, then that's what you need to do. Look, Steve, there's there's one thing. I, I, I'm looking at the clock. It's 930. we got 30 minutes left. left. Um, how are people going to defend themselves against the real days of Noah? Because this is something that I really believe in. You know, I, I've got a lot of friends. You do, too. They talk about the days of Noah. They talk about the giants. They talk about all that stuff. But I always get the feeling from them that it's like theoretical or something. Like they don't really, they don't really believe ninety percent of what they're saying. But I do, and I know you do too. That when Jesus said, "As it was in the days of Noah," he was being very literal. So how are they going to overcome the days of Noah? I mean, David, King David, he overcame the giant of his day. Others overcame the giants of their day, literal giants. How how tall was Goliath, right? Somewhere between 12 to 18 feet tall. I mean, it's just not even comparable. Well, okay, the most the most moderate estimate, I think, is nine point something feet tall. But we're talking about how in the world, if these things are so numerous that they're crawling like Joel says, like an army of locusts upon the wall. How in the world are you going to overcome that, right? People are people that are listening to the show tonight. If they could put that in a in an, in an honest, practical aspect, like tomorrow morning you wake up and giants are crawling on the wall. What's that going to do to your faith? How are you going to stand up and say, "I I know in whom I have believed." And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have entrusted to him against that day. Where will you find that kind of faith? So there's something I, I want to say. It, it's actually related to this zombie army concept, but I don't want to talk about zombies. Um, did any of you guys, Steve, Doug, Joe, did you ever see the movie that came out a while back um, with uh, Brad Pitt called World War Z? No. Nope. Well, well, you should. Go see it. It's And right now it's on Netflix. You can watch it for nothing if you have a, a subscription. This is a zombie film, but it's different than any other zombie film ever made in, in a lot of different ways. The zombies are really fast. They're not slow. They're not plotting. These guys are fast, and they're rabid. Um, but there's a feature part of that film that I found to be prophetic, um, historic, particularly interesting. And for those who have seen the film, they'll know what I'm talking about. It's where, as this infection spreads, Israel, of all nations, they abandon the Palestinian territories, and they initiate this nationwide quarantine. They close their borders to, to everyone except the uninfected uh, Jews and Palestinians. But guess what they do? They build this giant wall around Jerusalem, and it becomes, for a while, it becomes the city of hope. That reminded me of how in ancient times gigantic walls were built to keep out various kinds of uh, threats. I wonder how many people know that the very first giant walls, such as, for instance, the wall of Jericho that you read about in the Bible, I'm not, I wonder how many know that those appear to have been built in a rush, I mean rapidly, and in order to keep something out, not in, out, um, 
there's a, there's a, there's a piece of history here that we, we're not going to have time to talk about. Um, Are you there, John Tom? Walls, yeah, I'm there. I, I, somebody was knocking on the door on this building, and it was it threw me off. The giant walls around Jericho. They were built in a rush because, most likely, of the first appearance, and let's call this as an Old Testament antichrist-like army, the Nephilim. And I'm looking at the clock. I realize we didn't, we're not going to have time to go into these details. But let me just say, the city of Jericho, um, this is believed by most scholars to have predated the days of Jared. So now we're talking about the book of Enoch, right? The book that tells us when the watchers came down and the giants and all that. The, 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 the city of Jericho predated that time. Uh, Jared lived five generations after Adam. But it was during his days that texts say the watchers descended, they gave birth to the Nephilim. Here you have this city that most Bible scholars date to around 8,000 years before Christ. And then the early earth creationists say, well, it couldn't have possibly been more than 4,000 years before Christ. Bottom line is this thing goes back to the beginning of known history, pre-pottery, Neolithic a culture types where all of a sudden something happens. These are people that just live in huts, and all of a sudden, for no un, for no known reason, they very quickly feel the need to surround this settlement with a stone wall that's ten feet thick and very high. It extends around the whole occupational mound for a distance of uh, uh, of nearly a half of a mile. In addition to that great wall, the Jericho inhabitants, uh, they construct a gigantic stone lookout tower that's 33 feet tall, uh, feet in diameter, not tall, in diameter. Uh, and debates about how tall it is, but very, very high. They also dig this gigantic uh, ditch, this, this um, cutout, if you will. It's cut out of solid bedrock around the outside of the settlement. It's nine feet deep. Um, it's more than half a mile long. And, and, and the bottom line is this is all done without metal tools. So we're talking about uh, something major confronting uh, an early pre-Neolithic culture, people that live in mud huts that suddenly feel some desperate reason why they got to keep something out of their city, some kind of an aggressor that's perceived as a phenomenal threat to the welfare of this simple dwelling hunter-gatherers. Um, something caused them to rise up in haste and, and desperation to build this giant wall, this lookout tower. And by the way, if it had been a natural army, just a, you know another civilization living next door to them, this small city of hut dwellers would have done what they always did, that it just ran to the hills, that it moved on. There is no explanation in history why all of a sudden this threat was something that they evidently perceived as so astonishing that they couldn't outrun it, they couldn't hide from it, and their only defense was to build this enormous wall that the threat couldn't easily jump over and, and, and so on. Um, and then, of course, on the heels of that comes this story about the Watchers who came down. And they created something known as the Nephilim. And these Nephilim were enemies of mankind, and they were enemies of the um, covenant people of God. Um, so there is, there, is, there is historicity that suggests that this, like this modern story, this World War Z, this idea about the zombies, um, why would this story, uh, that World War Z, depict the ancient city of Jerusalem reverting back to this olden concept of a giant wall, that man, this horde is so monstrous, there's so many of them, that they are running upon the wall, oh, wait a minute, 
That's exactly what the book of Joel says is going to happen, isn't it? It says that the time is coming when there's going to be an army, and people are going to be building walls like in this World War Z. They're going to be building walls, gigantic walls, to try to keep something out of their city. But the book of Joel says they're going to run upon the walls. Um, And actually it even describes them using the ancient term Giborim. So what I'm saying is, could there be a zombie apocalypse? Could there be something that's going to give birth to an army of individuals whose brains have somehow, through genetics uh, or through some bioweapon, has been taken over? Is the Pentagon preparing for that because they know it's a reality? Yeah, I think all of that is true, but I also think that in prophecy it tells us that there is something that is beneath the earth. It's percolating. It's going to come up. And... um, and I think that somehow in the psyche of humanity, they realize that. I, when, I couldn't get away from the fact when I was watching this World War Z that they reverted back to this ancient technology of just simply building gigantic walls. Why wouldn't they just send in a bunch of airships? Why wouldn't they just send in a bunch of Apache helicopters, right, and blow up whoever the adversary is? Well, because it's swarming the earth like a locust horde. They're so stupid, many of them, that there's no way to defend yourself against them in those ways lest you absolutely destroy the earth itself and every civilization on every city that's on the earth. So um, I, I would encourage you guys, go watch that movie, World War Z, and ask yourself why in the world would the makers of this film have depicted Jerusalem as the last bastion that's using ancient technology like those <coughs> around Jericho did when something that had never happened before suddenly erupted from out of the earth or upon the earth. But biblical prophecy tells us that this is going to happen again. By the way, (coughs) Steve, on the return of those entities, I know we're going to run out of time here. Those entities that are going to run upon the wall, (coughs) according to Scripture, (coughs) the Bible says they're bound within the earth. And you know that article a couple of weeks ago from MSNBC that said that there was this strange sound that was being yes. heard around the world, a hum that's driving people insane and nobody knows what's causing it? Did you see that? Absolutely. I post. I put it up, too. Well, I forwarded it to one of the world's smartest, most well-known scholars. He's somebody you know and I know. Um, I'm not going to say his name because I don't want people emailing him, bugging him. But I asked him what he thought about it. Um, guess what he emailed back? I'm a, I'll quote. I won't say who, but I'll quote exactly what he said to me. He said, quote, Tom, they're busy down there, aren't they? Those pesky subterranean dwellers must know that something's up. The word is out that they'll soon be released to the surface of the earth, and they're getting excited, end quote. Right, and I think it's important that where everyone's poo-pooed the hollow earth, for so long, you saw the mainstream. Actually, you sent it to me. The mainstream now is talking about that. And also, I want to put the most important story I think that broke was the, if you will, the Sumerian cylinder. Because I've said this so many times on on this radio show or a radio show, whether it's Hagman and Hagman or my own years ago. But the it's interesting because when the Pentagon talks about this, those who have the appropriate clearance level, they always talk about the gods of the Sumerians, and the Sumerian Pyramid uh, uh, Codex basically said that there were kings on the earth 241,000 years before uh, the earthly kings appeared, and they even said in this article, which was not a Christian article, but there came a point where it all turned to, you, you probably saw it, where it was similar to Genesis, well, those kings that reigned twenty and 40,000 years weren't earthly kings. They were on the earth, but they were the fallen ones. You know, and again, you know, the point is, is, is the Nephilim, obviously the fallen ones, or you could call it those who descend from the Nephilim, the Gibberim, you, you brought that up. But here's the point. Tom, all of this stuff that's been hidden, even the Illuminati Luciferians, they have to tell what's getting ready to happen. And I believe that some of the sounds that people have been hearing, those strange sounds and stuff, I believe they're literally the gates of iron that are opening. And and whatever God has chosen to contain them in, and they know their day is coming. And I even believe that that scripture, hell 
from beneath has moved at that coming. That gives people uh, who don't believe in hell a real problem because they can't explain it. But it literally means that the evil one, the prince of darkness, is coming upon the earth, and they know it. So a sound has gone out of the bowels of the earth. It's resonating in the chambers and labyrinths of the damned, and they're getting ready to spring loose. And what I, I think uh, another way of looking at this, too, Remember, the U.S. military and all the militaries of the world that are going to give their power unto the beast are going to fight ultimately at Armageddon against God. And I believe, too, that they're building these things so they can escape. They know enough of the Bible, and they certainly know the army of the Lord, because we're not just talking about the armies of the Antichrist. We're talking about the armies of God that he releases on the uh, you know the people on the earth, not the people necessarily, but the entities on the earth that have gathered to make war. And I think that if you look at it, just put yourself in this position: all the elite want to be uh, uh, hidden away from the army that God's going to raise up in those days to take them on. And I, I think this: I think since they live in the world of gruel, gruesomeness, gore, and sacrifice, I think it's okay in their world as long as it's everybody else, but not them. Right. So blood well, on the altar? Hey, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> in case people um, think that this is just Steve Quell and Tom Horn, it's NASA. It's the European Association of Geochemistry that actually published research, and by a team of Harvard scientists who, and they're not just saying, by the way, it's a theory. They're saying that they have confirmed that there is evidence of the remnants of an ancient Earth dating back to the time they say when something, now they say another planet, a massive heavenly body, something impacted the earth. Well, in the scripture, the only time I read of something like that is when Lucifer. Jesus said, I behold Lucifer like a star, Satan like a star, fall from heaven and impacted the earth. So something impacted the earth, these guys say, collided with our world as we know it. They say it produced the moon, but they're saying that portions of that earth exist deep within the earth's mantle as we know it. Now, that only come that only came a week after scientists said that they have concrete evidence now of a subsurface ocean. And by the way, they're saying that this subsurface ocean it's three times bigger than all of the surface oceans combined, right? So is there yep. life in it? That's their next question. Is there life in it? And um, they believe that a previously unexplained isotopic ratio from deep within the Earth right now is sending a signal. That's what they're saying. Go read it for yourself. Sending a signal that a previously uh, a material, if you will, existence from before the Earth as we know it today collided with another whatever, what, planet-sized body, Lucifer, whatever, it hit something. Something collided with the Earth. It created the moon. It wiped out the dinosaurs. It did all that stuff. And by the way, two of the different universities that are studying this are talking all the way back to 4.5 billion years ago. So we already know that the young Earth creationists, are not going to like this um, evidence. Old Earth creationists don't have no problem with it because they too believe in a literal six days of creation, but they also happen to believe that the Earth existed a long time and the universe did um, before the six days of creation. But here's what I thought was real interesting, Steve. They've dubbed this whatever it is, right, this whatever it is that impact with, impacted with the Earth. They, they're saying that this was... Thea, T-H-E-I-A. Thea is the ancient goddess, the female equivalent of Lucifer, the female light bearer, the shining one. And so they've named this whatever it is, the female equivalent of Lucifer, the light bearer, that impacted with the earth four and a half million years ago, they're saying. Well, it doesn't matter if their timing is right, their timing isn't right. Bottom line is, What's very interesting right now is this raises the question, uh, does it not, of Admiral Richard Byrd, this highly decorated war hero. You've talked about him before. 
And according to his own diary, if you can believe that his diary is real, he entered the earth in 1947. 1947 was a really important time because it sounds like portals were opening. Things were happening in Roswell. Things were happening in other places. But if you can accept that his diary was real, he found that portal open. He entered into to the earth. He found a subterranean world that was inhabited by an advanced intelligence. Now, uh, is his you know is his diary right? I don't know. All I know is he was a decorated war hero. I don't know of any reason why he would have lied. But set him aside for the moment. To this day, there are those who believe that the world does host a second unknown and interior world and for those who may not know this the bible actually supports that idea the fact that the earth is a holding tank for intelligence that's very solid biblical theology um it's the location of the old testament paradise it's the location of the old testament shale hades other places in scripture tell us that it's a subterranean reality known in the book of Revelation, chapter 9, verse 14, where the four angels uh, are bound in the great river Euphrates. Job 26, 5 talks about dead things that are formed from under the waters. We talked about that earlier, but the the literal Hebrew there says, the Rapha, fallen angels, writhe from beneath the waters. Um, And again, this goes back to the the belief by the Greeks who stole their understanding from the early Hebrews that beings and regions are under the control of supernatural gatekeepers that are holding these gate openings on the earth itself that's associated with Hades. Uh, Anyway, very fascinating, right? Matthew 16, Jesus says, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, or son of Jonah, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But if you want to know what he means by that, in the Old Testament, Jonah, who he names Simon Bar-Jonah after, Jonah 2.6 tells of Jonah going down to the bottom of the sea to a city of gates. The Hebrew there is Berabach. It means a fortress inside the earth, a place uh, where there are intelligences uh, from which God is going to deliver them. And, uh, and, and in fact, there's no doubt where Jonah was because he prays to God in the text out of the belly of hell and the the hebrew there the underworld prison hell this is the underworld prison of the dead Uh, but in matthew in the new testament jesus connects that rock upon which the church is going to be built the name of jodah and the gates of hell to this conclusion that the that those gates are not going to overcome uh his authority so i would i would I'm, i'm we're running out of time here but i would really challenge people to go and study this issue matthew 12 uh, as Jonas was three days in, and nights in the wells, belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So there's this evidence in Scripture that there is an existence, an intelligence, and it's in the belly of the earth. It's inside the earth. But the Old Testament speaks of another form of existence that's within the earth, and it prophesies that is going to be released in the latter days. And, of course, now I'm talking about uh, giants that I believe are going to be part of this army of the Antichrist, this army that rises up in blood on the altar, the coming war between Christian versus Christian. I think that that's going to be something that people better be ready for that. Uh, or, or Hey, Tom, to just, yeah, just, just to put this into perspective for you, too, Years ago, I had active duty special operations generals tell me that the Nazis, and this is interesting because if anybody, and not that I'm telling anybody to watch it, but I asked a specific question. I said, how advanced, this will play into your statement on 1947, I said, how advanced were the Nazis in their uh, Stargate technology and their portal opening technology? And he said, do you remember the scene at the beginning of the movie where there's U.S. soldiers and they're watching this Nazi experiment? He said, that literally was a real experiment. And he said the Nazis perfected it. Flash forward to Under the Earth, Admiral Byrd. I mean, there was a reason why Admiral Byrd said that. And I asked him point blank, active duty, two 
two different four-star generals. I said, are the bird diaries accurate? They said, absolutely, absolutely. I also asked uh, if Forrestal, you know, uh, was murdered, and they said, absolutely. The, the idea that, that the United States won World War II is, is absolutely set against the truth of history in 1947. There's a great documentary, and I'm encouraging people to go. Go on YouTube and type in Russian Documentary Operation High Jump. People have tried to poo-poo that, and, and I'm telling you point blank, that uh, in my book, Long Walkers, I, I wrote the fictional account of what I've been told is the real case. But even the earthquakes that are happening now off the coast of South America in the Atlantic and it, it pretty much in the southernmost part of the Atlantic Ocean, those are supposed and reported bases for these things. And, and by the way, the Argentinian newspapers, I wish I, I, wish I would have learned Spanish in college, but uh, the, uh, the, the actual days of... Uh, the late, uh, excuse me, late 30s, early 40s are just complete with stories of flying saucers leaving and entering the ocean. And obviously, there's still, and I could be off here, I'll have to check my own book, but I think there's still 200 and either 200 or 238 U-boats that are unaccounted for that the creme de la creme of the Third Reich split to the secret lands under the Arctic, which basically were called New Schwabenland. Now, if those things are true, then that explains how all this, and let's fast forward to CERN now. CERN, they're going to double the power. And I even told people that I know what shut it down last time. It was not somebody's ham sandwich or crumbs or bird poop or squirrels. It was a very elite team of, in those days, uh, you know, faithful Americans that shut that thing down because I was given information from scientists through a third party that said when they opened, when they put the full power on the CERN, they were seeing entities, and it scared, quote-unquote, the hell out of them. I can't even imagine, Tom, the timing of when they double the power on that, because they're going to, you know, we've, we hear of blast doors as something that uh, literally are designed to protect you against atomic blast or a uh, conventional explosion. These blast doors are literally going to open the gates of hell, and I think that that's what, what you have been so on the forefront and thank God for that revelation, because that launched me, the Lord, that you, you know, that launched me into a whole different level of understanding. So, ladies and gentlemen, it is up to you who have listened to Tom Horn and I tonight on Blood of the Altar. By the way, is that book available now, or is it next week? Uh, that book, that book will be available this coming Tuesday. And again, for the uh, people that are listening to the Hagman and Hagman Show, if they want to get the seventy dollars worth of free products. Go to RaidersNewsUpdate.com. They'll see the banner up there. Click on it. It'll give you the summary of the book, Blood on the Altar, but also those free products. It's a very short term, one week at most, maybe three or four days um, giveaway. Uh, and so if they want those products, they can get them. Let me, I, I know we're going to run out of time. I want to say something very quickly. Besides things coming up out of the earth, Steve, there's also the scripture that says that things are going to come upon the earth, not just up out of the earth, upon the earth, and that men's hearts are going to fail them for fear. You mentioned earlier the Sumerian pyramid. Um, if it doesn't, if it turns out that it's not a fake, there's the asteroid um, that our Osiris Rex 2016 mission is designated already from the United States to visit um, in six years from right now. On that asteroid, the Indian Space Research Organization, uh, if it doesn't turn out to be a hoax, and it right now does not look like it's a hoax. It doesn't. It looks like it's real. They filmed it. Um, it's, uh, this is an asteroid that's on NASA's budget to visit. It's considered potentially dangerous. Um, uh, it, but... Um, I don't. Do you have the link on your website? I'm not sure if yes. Donna has the link on our website, but there are images of that asteroid from the Indian Space Agency today that are absolutely incredible. If it turns out to be true, I don't think it's a hoax. Uh, in fact, I saw that um, you know some of the the mainstream websites are carrying this same video. And if this turns out not to be a, a, a hoax, it's one of the most astonishing pieces of film uh, ever recorded because it shows an absolutely perfect, massive black 
pyramid with a brilliant capstone and four doors on all four sides of it, and this thing is headed towards the earth. Well, if it's real, it's astonishing. It could be, if it turns out to be real, it could be an active or remnant of unknown tech that could explain why NASA chose it in the first place. Why did they choose that asteroid to visit? Maybe this is something that's going to play a role in great deception. We know that there is a staple doctrine among ufologists about the discovery of artificiality on exoplanets. Um, We'll wait and see. I'm not saying it's real, but I'm telling you that today we did uh, research into it, and so far everything we've been able to find suggests that this is a real video that was captured by the... um, uh, uh, Indian Space Agency, and if that thing is real, go and watch the video for yourself. If it's real, brother and sister, we could really be looking at something right now. Um, I almost hope it's not real. I almost hope it turns out to be fake because it, it's a little bit too spooky for even my uh, choice. Hey, guys, thanks for having me on the program with you tonight. If people want to know more about Blood on the Altar, they can go to RaidersNewsUpdate.com. Steve uh, and uh, uh, Doug and Joe, at some point in the future, we probably should do a show on uh, preparedness uh, that would deal with some of these other questions that people might have right now about how in the world they're going to deal with this coming war on true Christianity. Amen. Amen. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time, both of you. We are out of time. Uh, Steve and Tom, uh, have a great holiday. Uh, Steve Quayle from stevequayle.com, Tom Horn, RaidersNewsUpdate.com. Take advantage of the offer there, and also bookmark Steve Quayle's website. Uh, check the Q alerts every day. Steve, thanks for, for uh, uh, handling this uh, interview tonight. Tom, thanks for appearing. You're welcome. Good night, everyone. God bless each and every one of you. Bye-bye. Good night. Tom, thanks so much. God bless. Until tomorrow, we'll be live here on July 4th. Hope you guys can join us while you're spending time with your families with special, our yeah. uh, Intelligence Insider W. It's going to be a very unique and special show with a special message. And God bless each and every one of you. Catch it on the archive if you can't listen live. We will be here Saturday as well. Until then, stay safe. God bless. Have a great holiday. <laughs>